Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Sarah Abdullaha. I'd like to welcome you all here today. Uh, we will talk about uh, telemedicine and patient experience and satisfaction in outpatient clinic. And uh, I have a little bit of point to cover regarding our topics for today. We will talk, first of all, we just, we will have an uh, overview uh, about telemedicine and telehealth. Telehealth, a term uh, refers to much wider scope of tasks, some of which don't do it directly involving dealing with patients, such as administrative meeting or training medical education as such. Telemedicine is one aspect of the wider telehealth ecosystem. Telemedicine refers to a form of remote delivery of provision of care services and clinical information by medical professionals, such as the diagnosis, the treatment, or follow-up. Using the telecommunication strategy, technology to communicate with their patient rapidly and limit the need for physically attending the clinic. Telemedicine has been shown <clears throat> the benefit to all stakeholders, such as providers, patients, and healthcare services itself. Then uh, let's have uh, a little about the Ministry of Health in Saudi Arabia is concerned with telemedicine as part of its relentless pursuit of tangible progress in the field of e-health. This is happening through the national e-health strategy and shift toward electronic transactions. What's the national e-health strategy? The nation, this strategy and its roadmap provide strong planning for fully fledged group of projects aiming at realizing this vision. Thank you, Doctor. This is the slide. Uh, there will be challenge for the program management for the beginning of change process at the Ministry of Health and its maintenance, mobilizing the services providers and staff in order to cope with the scope of the program and its life, life of frame. Last, the last uh, definition we have, the National Health Information Center. It's responsible for telemedicine control and monitoring the, regul the regulation that all healthcare providers receive training in the use of these services and that the training will be approved by Saudi Commission for Health, for health Specialists. The training shall include mat material related to, to telemedicine and associated legislation, telemedicine application to the specialty of the healthcare provider. Uh, then let's uh, talk about the study design of our uh, paper. The study was a cross-sectional design that surveyed patients surveyed patient in central hospital, in outpatient clinic. Uh, we have a questionnaire was distributed to these patients, including question about their demographic information, uh, their accessibility to telemedicine clinics, specialties of the clinics that they attend, and their satisfaction with the provided services. Next. Now we have the findings. Uh, we have uh, received, exceed our initial estimation of the responses, and then we received 50, 500 uh, of responses. But two, 235 respondents had used this telemedicine services previously and were able to answer the survey question and thus eligible for our inclusion criteria in the analysis. We have uh, two main categories of the respondent characteristic and the access of te to telemedicine. Upon that, we mentioned the satisfaction level of the patient or uh, the respondent. Next. The respondent, the characteristic of respondent. We have demographic information of the, of the respondents about, we ask them about their gender, if they are male or female. And the, uh, age group, then the educational level. It has been demonstrated that more than three quarters of the respondent was female and the other was male. Uh, let's say 76.2% female and 34 were in the age group of 38 to 47 years old. And only 6.8% were in the age group above 60 years old. 
In terms of the educational level, 57.9% of the respondents have university degree, and only 3.4% have degree from intermediate school. All the characteristic respondents here shown in the table. Uh, then we ask, respondents were asked about their access to different telemedicine services. The respondents were asked if they have a stable internet connection in order to support their access to telemedicine services. They have to choose from strongly agree to uh, the five like like skills from starting from strongly agree, agree neutral, disagree, and strong, strongly disagree. Uh, let's present uh, these, uh, let's say, important uh, numbers or percent of, uh, and it shows an enhanced uh, level of satisfaction with the patients. 58.3% uh, confirmed that they have stable internet connection, while 17% strongly agreed about it. On the other hand, only 5% disagreed, and 2.1% strongly disagreed about having the stable internet connection to, us, to access their in telemedicine services needed for them. Additionally, there were multiple clinics identified to offer telemedicine services in different specialties, when respondents were asked about the clinic that they use telemedicine services to access. Here, there are shown the clinics that attended by the respondent. It has been revealed that the highest rate of use was 24.3% of the respondents use the telemedicine service in the internal medicine clinics, while the lowest rate of use only 5% access services in psychiatry clinic. There were multiple methods that were used by respondents of the accessing to telemedicine services. These services include tele telephone, online perception services. Uh, we have WhatsApp messaging, uh, virtual clinics, and hotlines. More than half of the respondents, 68.5, use the telephone to access telemedicine services, while only 6.4% use the hotline. Internet access, clinic specialties, and mode of accessing telemedicine services are detailed and shown in the table. Next, Doctor. Next. Now let's talk uh, on the most important uh, view we have about patient experience and views on telemedicine. On five point like Likert scale, respondent were asked to express their opinions about different aspects of telemedicine services that they have access to through the hospital. Starting with the benefits of telemedicine, almost half of the respondents, 50.6% agreed that they could talk e easily to their healthcare providers. And 54.5% agreed that they could hear their healthcare providers clearly during their telemedicine consultation. Additionally, 47.2% of the patients agreed their healthcare providers are able to understand their healthcare conditions and need through, telemedicine, through the telemedicine. However, there were conflicting opinions about telemedicine offering uh, the same, same level of experience in seeing healthcare providers virtually. If they were in person in the clinic, where 26.4% of the patients agreed and 26.8% disagreed. As for assistance, 43% yeah, 43 of the respondents needed assistance to use the telemedicine services. Also, 48.1% agreed that they were comfortable about communicating with their healthcare providers in this manner. In terms of access to telemedicine services, it was shown that 29.4% of the respondents were a neutral, neutral whether, whether the telemedicine improved their access to healthcare services or no. Furthermore, let's say 32.3% of the patient agreed that the healthcare provided via telemedicine was consistent while similar was neutral about it. In term, uh, let's move to the time saving. In terms of time saving, 45.1% of the patients agreed that telemedicine saves their time and money for traveling to the hospital or specialized clinic and 35.7% agreed that the telemedicine services provide them with the health care, with their health care need. Additionally, almost similar proportion of responses, 
36.6% mentioned that they found the telemedicine an accessible way to receive the healthcare services. And 36.2% will use the telemedicine service again and again in the future. 24.7% of respondents indicate that the only drawback of telemedicine service was the patient not receiving adequate attention, attention from the providers. Here, the graph shown what? Similar to opinions about telemedicine service, overall satisfaction with telemedicine service was evaluated through same five Likert scale where patient had to choose from strongly agree to strongly disagree. It has been illustrated that 41.7% agreed that they were satisfied with their telemedicine service experience, while only 23.4% uh, uh, agreed that they were satisfied but by the telemedicine and 23.4 were neutral and only 8.9% were unsatisfied with the service provided. Then just to end and uh, include with the uh, recommendation that we found from, let's say from our study or our paper. Our present study would endorse some important recommendations that can lead to significant improvement in healthcare services provided in the future. This could be particular importance in outpatient clinic in Saudi Arabia, as well as at discharge counseling for patients who had a procedure and are about to be discharged from hospital or follow up. Furthermore, the awareness of patients about telemedicine clinics should be increased and improved in order to encourage them to use the services inquired about its availability. This awareness can be carried out through companies in primary care clinics, at hospital common areas, about discharge after hospital admission, or after performing some procedures and through other communication meters. Uh, such as text messaging or through patient portals or also uh, about the banner or posters in healthcare institutions can inform the patients about the availability of these services and how to access to it. Although the finding from present study highlight the importance and significance of telemedicine services and the high satisfaction rate among patients with, which demonstrate meeting their needs larger studies are needed to support and expand this finding. Other studies across Saudi Arabia should be conducted in order to understand national patient satisfaction level with telemedicine. Also, other variables should be considered with assessment uh, of satisfaction level of patient toward telemedicine, uh, including some social demographic information such as income level of patients, employment status, marital status, these are contrib contributing factors can be affect the satisfaction level of patient with telemedicine services. Other factor could be related to medical history and medical presentation to the clinic. This could be in the form of the comorbidity that patients may have and whether they present to the clinic with an acute condition or chronic condition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarah. It's really um, impressive to have uh, such a study. And I would like to focus. So in, in your study, what was the best modality to, uh, to communicate uh, with uh, patients or patient relatives? I know that you did uh, WhatsApp and other methods of uh, communication. But what do you think is the most appropriate uh, for medical uh, patients and surgical patients? For the medical patient, I think the video call or let's say the virtual clinic, it will sure it will be better than the telephone. But uh, how do you find this in uh, in areas where the uh, examination of the patient is quite essential? You know, this is one of the cornerstone of the disadvantage of virtual clinics is an ability of the physician to examine the patient. So how do you find this in your study? I couldn't, uh, let's say, consider this exactly as a telesurgery because uh, I am an outpatient clinic, but uh, maybe it's in follow-up, not examination, not uh, in the diagnosis. Maybe it will be in the treatment or following up after uh, doing some procedures. In my opinion, sure, it will be better. 
because uh, also the patient will feel more, more comfortable while uh, communicate, communica or let's say physically attending the clinic while examination time. I see. Uh, Dr. Abdul Hamid, any question? Dr. Abdul Hamid Haraka? Dr. Abdul Hamid? Dr. Abdul Hamid is our second chair person. Uh, so if he's not available, I would like to really thank you, Dr. Sarah, and uh, you are welcome to join us to share the next of the sessions. I think the next session is uh, to Dr. Abdul, Abdul Halim. Dr. Abdul Halim is available. Yes, you raised your hand. Uh, admin, please, Dr. Abdul Halim, Abid, Abid Halim, please transfer the host. Maybe I have to close the video from me to be present for uh, Professor Abdul Hamid. Uh, I stopped share at my side. Dr. Abdul Hamid, are you able to uh, to uh, you can stop the video from your side. Let's try, Doctor. Okay. The the, the admin is uh, admin Dr. Abid Halim. Abid Halim. The next horse is Abed Halim. Okay, Dr. Abed Halim, you are the host now. You can share your screen. Are you around, Dr. Abed? myself. Yes, Let's Dr. Abed. Let's welcome Professor Abdul Halim. He's a professor of mechanical engineer. Can you hear us, Dr. Abed? Uh, yeah, Mike. Uh, yeah. No, I am. I think I am video and audio. Both things are uh, operational. Uh, uh, would you give me just a minute to introduce Dr. Sarah? Can you introduce, please, Dr. Abed? Yeah, let's welcome Professor Abed Abdul Halim. He's a professor of mechanical engineering. Today, he will talk about telemedicine for healthcare capabilities, future players, and applications. Welcome, Dr. Abdul Halim. You can start. You put your mic mute, please. Yeah. Turn it on. In our place, uh, we are uh, Asalaamu Alaikum and very good afternoon. Uh, I am from India, Jamia Milia Islamia. And uh, in our place, like uh, just a minute, I have to. Is my screen. Uh, If you have difficulty in sharing the screen, you can send me the lecture on uh, to my email. I'll open it at my site if you have difficulties. No, 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 nothing like that. Because we have been doing it, no issue. Uh, uh, there is the view, there is the chat, share the screen. Yeah. And, and also, I would like I would like you to increase. I would like you to increase the mic uh, level because your voice is very low. If you can. Yeah, yeah. I will increase my voice. And uh, no, I mean from the sitting, from the sitting of the mic, sitting of your mic. Yeah. Now I have got the. I think I'm able to share. Yes. Yes. Very good. Yeah. It's visible. Yes, very good. Go ahead. Just I want to set something. Uh, this is uh, Professor Halim, uh, Abid Halim from Jamia Milia Islamia. And uh, we are the number two university of India. 
I am here uh, to present uh, my paper uh, that is on telemedicine for healthcare capabilities, features, barriers, and application. This presentation uh, is about introducing the telemedicine for healthcare and then it's some benefits for COVID-19 pandemic, its capabilities, treatment process, workflow treatment process and application. The regular, uh, I'm visible to everybody. Yes, regular yes. hospital visits can be expensive, particularly in rural areas and far off places due to travel costs. Especially in India, it is very expensive to go from far off places and then the medical facilities are also not available. So there is a need to develop and operationalize an IT enabled system, we call it platform, that can bring doctor near to the patient and vice versa. This is something which we have been thinking about, but this technological development, we call it disruptive technological innovation, came into prominence with COVID-19. And what I foresee that in the future, this system would remain and it would complement and supplement our healthcare systems because this will improve the follow up and the patient outcome. The telemedicine introduction is that is a basically a health related service. We call it tele means that telecommunication technologies, electronic technologies, IT support systems, advanced digital technologies are used to help medical care. So we call it telemedicine. So it is an overall, uh, overall system which is developed. And uh, these has certain deliverables, design deliverables to enable patient and their physician. The future of this system is very bright with holography and virtual reality. So this system no doubt has wide range of uses like online patient consultations, remote control, telehealth, nursing, remote physical and psychiatry rehabilitation and it allows for better healthcare choices increasing emergency service quality and performance. It reduces time in making a diagnosis and before we talk to the doctor, the lot of data is collected and it's provided to the assistant, which can give it to the doctor for better and quicker uh, decision. Advanced technologies, they work with quality network services that we need a prelude to this telemedicine. And then a software support, and hardware devices are also required. Everybody uh, in India, the, this telemedicine became quite popular during COVID-19. The top hospitals, doctors, they started consulting online. It was a very basic system, which has just a laptop 
and a patient talking with a whatsapp or some skype or a zoom or sometimes a google meet or something like that and there was a very basic starting point the patient used to tell his diagnosis uh, symptoms then doctor asked him for certain lab tests and those lab start, lab tests are provided to doctor and this way it was being done in the starting days of the covid 19 here uh, just i want to tell about to you that in covid 19 it has reduced the risk of infection it has avoided face to face interaction among doctors and patients because in the best doctor in delhi is where i am residing they were available online they were not available in the hospital you have to talk to them online and they were available the surgeries were not performed but however the medicines and the other things were being done and the tests were also being performed at domestic at your home someone will come take sample and then the results will come to you through email so there is a minimization of risk to healthcare worker with minimum or no physical interaction so this is a uh, something which has basically helped lot of patients but no doubt those patients which are needing surgery which needing some hospitalization they were not helped by this technology so first of all i would like to introduce to a digital health system that is developed through tele medicine uh this is the digital health system uh these devices are now available the systematic prescription is given first is the cloud based healthcare system the patient data is being saved on the cloud and we know that in delhi all large hospitals big hospitals they have their cloud and they secure the patient test reports and they even use artificial intelligence in analyzing those reports they are sharing their things then digital health systems may there is lot of things like we take care here the clinical trials are also possible through telemedicine lot of medicines which can be checked which were given to patient administered to them and their trials results were shared and there was mobile health monitoring system also the health analytics has grown very fast and i told you that even the ct reports the x ray reports all the reports are being analyzed and ultimately we are trying to develop a system where better diagnosis can be done the variables for wellness is something which is known to everybody and we see that these variable devices are not now very common people have this variable device devices and uh, they basically walk they run and these smart devices they collect data they transfer to your cloud and those from those clouds they are being analyzed and holter system for old systems now we have online system and your heart your blood sugar level your bp and other things are being also being monitored now with biological sensors in future almost all of your blood parameters will be analyzed so this is the process that we used for covid uh, 19 uh, this workflow i am showing to you was the concept of telemedicine when it was used for covid 19 patient and it all started with the simple form information arranged by the medical representative hospitals and then appointments are fixed i told you online we will meet and then the patient talks to the doctor this is what the process was and the 
treatment process of COVID-19, they see very simple. The first thing is that you give the information, you give the, your test result, you go for online registration, and then you get a docket time. That when time when you have to uh, uh, when you have, when you can meet the doctor, you have to see the manuals, telehealth. Key. Then after getting the appointment, you have the interaction. In the interaction, before the doctor, the staff analyzes your result. Then it also analyzes your past reports, if any. Then it also write down your symptoms and then it provides things to the doctor and the doctor interacts with you. And here we have minimized the doctor interaction because the main Mute or remote control, let's say participants. We have no, uh, I don't. Uh, I mean, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No issue. I'm not going to get disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not getting any disturbance. Uh, the thing is it's getting recorded. Uh, the interaction with the doctor. See, I have also used this facility many times. Especially in COVID, it was a wonderful facility. And the doctors, even the nights, they were available to consult. But the they were charging the same fees. The fees for a telepatient and the fees for a normal patient was same. And even today, it is same. So after interaction, the doctor will go for diagnosis. We will write some more tests. You will write uh, some medicines, and those medicines will be sent to the patient through a email or sometimes through a WhatsApp, or sometimes the doctor's prescription is also sent through WhatsApp. So this was a simple process, and uh, there was no uh, VR devices, no augmented reality, no things uh, from the patient side. But ultimately, it proved very uh, cost effective to everybody. So we come to the capabilities and features of telemedicine when used in healthcare management system. The concept of telemedicine associate services have now well established. In five, five years before, nobody was ready for a telemedicine. They used to say the doctors can't come on a phone. No, it's not possible. But COVID-19 has taught us and we have become, we have become, now we can try to talk things on phone and through audio and video. So this next figure shows you various features and facilities offered by the telemedicine concept. So no doubt it uh, helps in prescription compliance. Very important thing is the person is not complying to the prescription given. to them. And uh, sometimes the tele-wearable devices, they help the, uh, the patients update it. So this is the feature of the telemedicine for healthcare. The first thing is the chronic health management. So we can have a chronic health management with the care after and hospitalization, and then hyper specialty care, where care is very frequently needed, and team-based medicine care. Then second is throughout care, the throughout then we have some devices which are put to you, remote facilities, where remotely you their devices are accessed and the data is passed. Then prescription compliance. Prescription may, a lot of patients don't take medicines on time. So, and then the patients can also go for a virtual second opinion. There are some psychiatric issues also, which can be very well dealt here. And the storing and forwarding is basically 
uh, you are storing the data and uh, like the elder care and the functional and other people are being helped here. Uh, this treatment workflow process has been used in for telemedicine care is being shown to you in the next figure. And uh, it's in line way representation of the workflow for attempting telemedicine culture based treatment in healthcare <laughs> services. Uh, the best thing is provide an ultra type facility and gives attention at every step during the implementation. <coughs> the first thing it starts with patient entry or detailed information, and then it's followed by the daily health supportive care unit. Uh, this is uh, the procedure, the fixing of appointment, the treatment, diagnosis, monitoring, and the patient entry details, details entry and information input. They are input to the telehealth support, and the output is the fixing appointment and telemedicine care unit for health. See, one thing that tele will always remain a virtual, it's not going to be a real, but with holography, we can come very near to the patient. So, what are the barriers for the adoption of telemedicine practices? Uh, the barriers which are being shown here in the next figure that come across the successful implementation of telemedicine care. They are very typical and the usual barriers. These are the barriers. First is the confidentiality. Patient confidentiality is a big issue. Data security is a big issue. And uh, Sometimes you are not being able to get the confidential things because all the things they come to the person, those who are working with the doctors, and the system can also be hacked. Then the patient uh, privacy. Here the patient is talking and the doctor assistants are speaking, but it can be controlled in a big way. The data accuracy is one important thing because many uh, test reports, they are not in that format that can be assessed through the telemedicine portal. Portal. So your reports are in different format and they are read as a JPG file. They are not read as a data file. So then the medical liability is here and uh, the fraud and abuse is also possible with this system. There can be doctors who may not be the real doctors, or sometimes there can be uh, abuses also. And uh, misdiagnosis is one very big issue here. Many a times, you are not able to diagnose the patient properly. And uh, I have seen that in telemedicine, the patient says something, the doctor understands something, and it is not the same which he can assess when he is seeing the patient. When the many systems save system symptoms also, they are not visible through the camera. Now we come to the last segment that is significant application areas. Uh, there are some uh, areas that uh, I have identified they can be uh, provided. Uh, this area is like uh, telehealth. Uh, the healthcare uh, creativity and the technological advancements, they are now helping the patient to have better health. And now the hospital systems, the medical groups, and the suppliers, 
they need to incorporate telemedicine into medical services. Uh, the, this concept can also be used by researchers, the clinicians, the lab staff, along with the doctors. And there can be a third party telemedicine provider who can provide them the support system with all the customized software. Because see, in COVID, we have not been able to develop customized software. But now the hospitals are developing customized software and it is getting advanced every day. Then about the disabled patient. So this is something because they, these patients, many of them, they are not able to walk. Some of them have disabilities, which basically is problem for them, old people. And some of them are culturally isolated. So here, the telemedicine can be a good point. Like if, so variety of medical conditions can be seen through telemedicine. And then the secondary system can be made operational after the telemedicine has been done. Then this remote treatment, remotely, it was basically for people who the doctors and the patients should not uh, be very close. It was basically developed for that. But remote means that patients are there at remote places, like I told you, but in India, where patients are at thousands of kilometers away, and here they are. But there are issues also here, because in many countries, these issues will be, there will be legal issues also. And there are some specialized doctors, very highly specialized doctors. Now, with telemedicine, these doctors are available. The, the person can talk to them, they can take second opinion with them. And the specialist role has become more prominent. So then the school going children, they have a potential here because if some children in the school get ill, so it can be picked up by the parents or nurse and urgent care facility and most Conveniently, they can be talked to a daily doctor. So, this forward looking schools partner with doctors to perform video tours from the classroom. Then, for any disorder which does not necessitate laboratory examination or physical examination, so this technology provides continuing treatment and especially the psychotherapy is very much possible here. The doctor's appointments can also be taken virtually and this age of social distancing, virtual doctor appointments are important. And I have seen in Delhi that in some telemedicine, uh, uh, tele, uh, their doctors appointment was basically full for weeks some good doctors uh, so telemedicine app growth is now a key target for healthcare providers and they need to customize it they need to make it better and virtual appointments can be made then only let, let we don't want patient to come to hospital all the time So the telemedicine is there, is here to enhance the overall healthcare system performance. And the telehealth refers to a wide variety of technology and facilities that are used to provide patient care and enhance the overall performance of the healthcare system. Uh, like uh, you go that in India, we have a lot of medical tourism. So the patients from Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, and uh, even New Zealand, Australia, they come to India because the healthcare facility is good and low cost. So there, before coming, they can have a telemedicine, they talk, they can have a telechat, and then the things can be put, put, and then they can travel and they come to India for the surgery 
when the doctor is available and the things are good for them to have surgery. So this is something, uh, because what happens earlier, the doctor used to go to New Zealand or to Australia, talk to the patient, see to them, then asking them to come to, to India for the operation. Now, the telemedicine will be helping it and the local doctor will be supporting it. That's it. Mobile messaging, we have seen all. So there we have a better patient coordination. The telemedicine has the potential to improve patient coordination. And here, the treatment shortage, overuse of medical care, inadequate drug use, unnecessary overlapping care may also re result from fragmented care. So this I see as a fragmented care. Uh, uh, patient benefit from less days from work, less travel cost, less overlap uh, with duty, less problems of privacy and proximity to the healthcare. So uh, traveling is also reduced. And tele-dentistry is something uh, like <laughs> very important. Uh, dentist, uh, sometimes you have dentures problem and your teeth problems and what to do, then you can take your photographs, talk to doctor, and instead, instead of just uh, seeing the dentist, you are having a tele-dentistry. And dentist exchanges records and they suggest the treatment. The specialists are also available. And because what happened was that in COVID-19, it was the dentists which were getting the maximum infection. And because you are operating through a mouth and the disease is in the mouth. And so the lot of infection was there. So uh, better service for clinician and patient is applied, is provided by the telemedicine application. And uh, the, uh, the need for an Healthcare provider is to have better patient service, which telemedicine systems will achieve while still assisting physicians to refine and improve their private practice. As a result, developing medical video conferencing applications in some kind of medical institution is critical in order to make medicine telemedicine. So uh, this due to the seriousness of the global shortage of skilled healthcare provider, this is a uh, gap arrangement. So digital telehealth uh, monitoring is something which is the future, and you have uh, you have devices. We can you have a three-dimensional viewing and video conferencing. Machine learning technologies are there to and identify the patient uh, cases. And different uh, artificial algorithms are being used for diagnosis and disease forecasting. Better. So telemedicine is a method for connecting physicians in one area with patients, another area using networking devices. Uh, skin care is one important area. Uh, I think uh, my time is uh, over. And uh, the tracking patient is one uh, for medication is something important because old patients and many patients, they don't take their medication. So they can be tracked online and uh, the, the devices can be set and they can be asked to take medication and mobile can settings can be there and there can be apps which helps them in tele information and their blood sugar level and their other parameters data can be transmitted to provided to doctor and then it is easy for emergency services. And no doubt, telemedicine started prominence with the infectious diseases. And uh, this uh, is a making a uh, patient in, uh, we, are, we are trying to have the security of the patient information. And uh, with telemedicine, we are also trying to have re reduced number of emergency visits. Now, there are some limitations that we talk about. The telemedicine is not a substitute for 
medicine doctors own your own going to doctor talking to him a surgery no it's not substitute it just complement just complementing just supporting the healthcare it is supporting the healthcare here the focus is on patient self report the patient has to be honest the reporting should be accurate and data should be accurate when we are developing the software when we are going for virtual reality holography this is becoming expense and many a times because of the poor network communication it is giving bad or poor uh, diagnosis and uh, there is an issue of hacking the patient data because uh, this data which you talk to the people are they are going through the un encrypted channel if you are going through google meet or other things and sometimes when the person requires emergency care, care the technology can cause medication to be delayed mainly because the doctor cannot deliver life saving care or lab or lab test remote i told you that this is not and they have to take care for the privacy laws and the other laws also now the future is there no doubt is going to help the system and uh, the patient history is now available patient reports will not be available all time many net test is report should be put and the past prescriptions can be also uploaded and the doctor can quickly understand the patient issues and uh, we can you know use the local health care resources for the emergency services and for non emergency services so no doubt it's going to help the free part of the real health care but it's developing and uh, i am taking uh, this two papers of mine this paper i will be providing to you the telemedicine for healthcare capability features variants and application this presentation is part of these two paper that i have written here thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr abed it's it's really nice presentation uh, dr abdul hamid haraga are you available uh, yeah pardon i'm available no, i'm asking i'm asking yeah. Uh, our our uh, co chairperson dr abdul hamid haraga if he's available yeah abdul hamid uh, his name is uh, admin dr abdul hamid uh, name is written not haraga written as abdul hamid He raised his hand, so please transfer the host for him to see his comments. Uh, till we find uh, Dr. Abdul Hamid Haraga, uh, Dr. Abed, uh, what do you think about uh, surgical monitoring? Do you think surgical monitoring has a future from your uh, experience? Surgical monitoring. Uh, generally, you know, hospitals don't want to keep uh, patient for a long duration and good hospitals don't want to keep them now after surgery they want to send the patient to the home uh, when he becomes uh, of like, functional let's say start using the so there he can talk to doctor and he should not visit the hospital uh, every second day or third day so if a patient has been put to a surgical surgery and after he gains a certain level of health he can be put to the home and from that home he can talk to the doctor or to the other persons there in the hospital so this will be helping uh, the surgery uh, but it depends upon how you uh, how you use the 
system. And uh, I'm going to tell you that this is in the developing stage and many best, like Apollo Hospital is the best one which I see in Delhi. Uh, and the second one is Max Hospital. And the two, three top hospitals in Delhi, uh, they started using it, uh, but they are not using for surgery. The only thing is the, they're not using for surgical patients. Yeah. And any other question? Um, yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Abid, about this uh, very informative uh, uh, speech. Uh, I'm Dr. Haraga, uh, Abdul Hamid Haraga, a consultant general surgeon. Uh, I liked in your uh, presentation that you, you showed us this wide application of, uh, uh, let us say that the health uh, devices, actually it started even before COVID, about the checking yes, like right. that. We yes. started it, but it became, it got the prominent only in COVID. These things are simple, they were available. The video conferencing things were available. But in COVID, it became the uh, norm. And I'm gonna tell you the hybrid things will remain. But I, I'm, I'm concerning about, uh, I think you showed in figure five, about the barriers. Mm -hmm. barriers of telemedicine. So do you think that in the future, we can overcome these barriers and to make the telemedicine or in general telehealth more common and more applicable? Yes, see, the barriers are here to do research. This is here for the research. And I'm telling you that in future, we will be able to, uh, uh, be able to conquer those barriers. Uh, like uh, there are legal issues that a doctor sitting in India cannot write a prescription for a patient in US because the legal issues are different. In US, the doctor has a different type of qualification. A doctor of India cannot write a prescription for a patient in UK. So this is one of the legal things which has to government has to decide because if this is starts, there will be a lot of confusion also. Uh, second, uh, like if you see that the holography is coming and in COVID, the holography was used to show the lung condition, lung condition with the infection. So that was being used and the data was shared, holographic data was being shared. But holography needs not very high bandwidth system. And this is an issue, the uh, doctors are well, no, not doctors, the technologists are there who are trying to. And the AI disease forecasting is something which is happening very fast, very fast. And algorithms will be able to devise, find out what is the real problem with the patient. So there will be less misdiagnosis. The holography, what do you mean by holography? That, Sir, that holography means is three dimensions? Yeah, three dimensional image. That uh, patients three dimensional, like if you have a, CT scan, so CT scan can develop a three-dimensional image of the spine or from the body part. So that three-dimensional image can be transferred and the three-dimensional image can be seen. Like inside your lung, the three-dimensional image can be developed and it can be shown to doctor. Or sometimes okay. from outside also, if there are physical things like, so a physical patient can be, a physical doctor can also be seen. In front of the patient, the doctor will be there. Uh, yeah. And he'll talk in his, in his language. That devices are now available with IBM. Um, do you think in the future that this uh, so-called holography can solve the, bro the main problem, in my opinion, um, obstructing or uh, decreasing the application of this telemedicine, that uh, this telemedicine can be applied if you, you want to get physical uh, science that means the examination, uh, especially in surgery or in this in this in de dentistry, because you know that in, de in dentistry that mostly it needs some uh, manual or some action in the teeth. Yeah. So um, I, I don't know. So Maybe I in the future. You, hmm. I told you 
that uh, it is not an alternative it's just a supportive setting okay it is a supportive setting. Okay. surgery there is no alternative to surgery there is no hmm. alternative to taking out the doing the root canal there is no alternative okay thank you very much Th thank you thank you thank you very much thank you dr abid i think we'll move to the next uh, speaker dr sara can you present please the next speaker Uh, yes, let's welcome uh, Dr. Nishat Ahmed Sheikh. He's a doctor and uh, has a total more than 15 years experience of teaching and uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, participating in conferences and a lot of papers. And also he has uh, ongoing uh, publications. So welcome, uh, Dr. Nishat. You can start. Yes. Yeah, uh, my slides are visible. Yes, it's okay. Okay. Yes, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Dr. Nishat Ahmed Sheikh, a uh, professor and head in the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology at uh, Ames Devgar uh, from representing India. My uh, topic of presentation is Indian perspective on medical legal and ethical challenges in telemedicine. So uh, just to begin up with uh, telemedicine, uh, it means uh, healing from a distance. As we all know, the, even the World Health Organization uh, has adopted the following descriptions and has defined telemedicine as the delivery of healthcare services where distance is a critical factor by all healthcare professionals using information and communication technologies for the exchange of valid information for diagnosis, treatment and prevention of disease and injuries, research and evaluations, and for the continuing education of healthcare providers, all in the interest of advancing the health of individuals and their communities. So, because I am representing India, let us have some background of Indian health infrastructures. Indian population as such, we do not enjoy equal and universal provision of healthcare services. The statistics shows uh, barely 9% of the population is being covered by health scheme and the government's my government spends a meager of 0.9% of its gross domestic product on health. And if you compare with the World Health Organization recommendations, it is around 5%. Around 80% of specialist doctors in India do work in an urban areas. And the urban areas population account only for around 20 to 25 or around 30% of the population. Of this, uh, only 2% of the specialties operates in rural areas. And if we go by the statistics of the beds available per thousand people in urban area is 2.2. And whereas it is very pathetic at the rural areas, that is 0.19 beds per 1000 are available in the rural areas. If with this statistics, if India at some point decides to create a physical infrastructure to cover all the people for the rural areas with the current population levels, my government would like to set up around 700 hospitals, each with 250 beds capacity. 
which in turn would require huge investment in the health sector to avoid to to build up the infrastructure without being sure of availability of skilled manpower so coming on to the my actual topic on the medical legal issues let us have uh, yeah just yeah telemedicine offers the best possibility of reaching healthcare to all this was the theme which was recently given by the india also taken up by the india and the very aim of india was to bring the healthcare to even the most remote villages by harnessing satellites information technologies and existing health facilities telemedicine has emerged as a key driver of public private partnership for healthcare delivery to the remotest village in india now coming to the actual medical legal issues related with the telemedicine while surfing on to this topic i was surprised in india we had a telemedicine act which was passed in way back 9th of april in 2003 and which clearly defines that telemedicine to mean the practice of medicine delivered across the distance via telecommunication including audio visual and data communications and interactive video technology performed by licensed or otherwise legally authorized individuals now coming on to the medical legal issues the very first very important element which do arises is amongst the doctor patient relationship the patient trust the healthcare professionals while seeking treatment and confide in them the lack of face to face contact in some modes of telemedicine is seen as a barrier to adequate development of doctor patient relationship it is essential to maintain the trust of patient to meet the legal requirements healthcare providers are obliged to establish a good doctor patient relationship another medical legal importance in this telemedicine comes with the informed consent informed consent is an important medical legal requirement while treating a patient failure to do so in india is considered as a tort and a crime consent should be obtained for any medical interaction whether it is in person or at a distance such as telemedicine or a virtual consultation consent must be obtained for telemedicine interaction transmission of data treatment monitoring and consultation further it is important to clarify whether the medical legal value of informed consent in telemedicine is same or different with respect to traditional face to face interactions there is enough evidences that in many specialties virtual consultation such as video conference is clinically as good as in person consultation hence consent can be taken traditionally and properly documented this is also being taken into consideration and highlighted by world medical association in its statement of guiding principles for the use of telemedicine for the provision of healthcare in way back in 2009 as such the informed consent in telemedicine is mandatory in malaysia france united kingdom south africa and in california too malpractice and liability just a second yeah yes yes just lost with this okay 
yeah can physician be sued for mal- medical malpractice in telemedicine and virtual consultation and can they be protected by medical indemnity insurance important point in this context is the duty of care must be established in all telemedicine encounters to clarify responsibilities for the patient caregiver as well as other involved healthcare providers healthcare professional should clearly define the roles and responsibilities regarding the various aspects and the extent of treatment now in telemedicine concerning the privacy of the patient the right to privacy has been an integral part of medical ethics since the time of hippocrates and it is being very much supported by various codes including the international codes of medical ethics it mandates that the health practitioner must maintain confidentiality regarding personal information of the patient even after his or her death every individual has a right to privacy even in telemedicine there is the potential for leakage of electronic records of a patient the onus for safeguarding this information has to be on the medical practitioner information must be transmitted in a secure way password security must be maintained to avoid unauthorized access to the information however privacy cannot be guaranteed with the use of telemedicine now coming on to the product liability it is the liability of a manufacturer for any harm caused to the patient by a defective product thus it means the duty of care is owned by the manufacturer which includes the manufacturer of the computer system compatible for telemedicine manufacturer of compatible software manufacturer or supplier of various accessories related to telemedicine network provider healthcare service provider who is using the technology and the service company responsible for maintenance of the whole telemedicine unit of course in telemedicine there are certain rights of the patient tele traditional medical practice there are certain rights of the patients which are being recognized and documented such as right to get treatment choose a doctor freely change doctor at any stage of treatment right of compensation confidentiality dignity grievance redressal right of information and right to refuse treatment the same applies to the practice of telemedicine and virtual consultation currently there is no provision for reimbursement for medical insurance in telemedicine practice whether telemedicine was required or not in given situation is another condition which should be cleared for reimbursement purposes liability in civil negligences civil suit could arise out of a breach of contractual obligations between the telemedicine service provider and the patient user the supreme court of india has explained negligence as a breach of duty caused by the omission to do something which a reasonable man guided by those consideration which ordinarily regulate the conduct of human affairs would do or do something doing something which a prudent and reasonable man would not do the integral components to prove negligence are established meant of duty and dereliction of duty which are directly related to the damage caused liability in criminal negligence in context with the indian scenario we consider the negligence as a criminal negligence when it is gross in nature and that need to be proved beyond reasonable doubt the common charges for the indian doctors and other healthcare providers of such services with when they cause the death by negligence they are being charged under section 304a of indian penal code or if the patient life is being endangered or the personal safety of others are being endangered the section of 336 of indian penal code is being imposed 
if there is there's causing hurt by an act which endangers the life or personal safety of others it is section 337 of ipc and causing grievous hurt by the act endangering the life or personal safety of others section 338 of ipc is being imposed all this punishment includes the imprisonment uh, in the criminal negligence includes the imprisonment as well as fine under the relevant sections of indian penal code vicarious liability in the provision of e health services such as telemedicine where there is an employer employee relationship the employer could be proceeded against due to the principle of vicarious liability if deemed liable for acts and omission of the employee arising in course of his or her employment the principle of vicarious liability does not apply to criminal prosecutions liability under consumer protection act uh, this consumer protection act was passed way back in 1986 and it is being repealed once again in 2019 and 1920 the consumer protection act allows the consumer to claim compensation from service provider in case there is a deficiency in the service provided consumer can file claims for defective products and unfair trade practices consumer forum have been set up at the district state and national levels to hear such matters uh, in from india this earlier this healthcare sectors was not included in the consumer protection act way back in 1995 the honorable supreme court of india in vp shanta and i am versus i am a case included the healthcare sectors also in the consumer protection act what are the disciplinary control and ethical control over the medical doctors by the national medical commissions a patient is entitled to raise a complaint with the relevant state medical council against a doctor for the professional misconduct if complaint against the doctor has not been decided by the state medical council within 6 months from the date of receipt of the complaint the national medical commission may on its own or on the request of the patient ask the state medical council to decide on the complaint or refer the same to the ethical committee of the national medical council consumers who are aggrieved by the decisions of the state medical council also have the right to appeal to the national medical commission within a period of 60 days from the date of the order that was passed by the state medical council there are certain challenges and the future of this telemedicine there's a much hope for the future of telemedicine with rapid advances in technology telemedicine will become easier and more widely accepted in coming years for successful integration of telemedicine with the existing health structure we need to develop policies and guidelines and amend the acts the future directions and challenges could be institution of a regulatory authority we can have a standardized format of information to patient and consent form with option to opt in and out of the telemedicine mandatory telemedicine courses for medical practitioners and technical staff can be instituted responsibility for privacy confidentiality and security of the patient information and treatment accreditation or licensing of doctors using telemedicine should be initiated building confidence of both patient and distant doctors clear guidelines for telemedicine teleconsulting insurance clear guidelines on issue of telemedicine across national borders standardization of equipment and tele services with periodic checks and submission to health regulatory authority equipment liability and maintenance and safety telemedicine laws for information storage and access dedicated staff to manage telemedicine services establishing telemedicine unit at every hospitals and proper communication and documentation of course 
the maintenance and regular upgrading of the hardware and software. There is an urgent need to clarify medical legal issues pertaining to the use of telemedicine through legislations so that the doctor can use these services without reservations. There is also a need for an open platform for connectivity to use telemedicine, which means that telemedicine facility should be available easily in a secure manner to maintain confidentiality and privacy in the doctor-patient relationship. The use of smartphone-based applications should be developed to avail healthcare services so that a patient can contact a doctor without the need to go for a consultation physically. To conclude, in India where access to affordable healthcare services is an issue, telemedicine will definitely provide immense benefit to the public. Telemedicine allows for a new form of doctor-patient interactions, which need mutual trust and acceptance. Although WHO has given importance to telemedicine, there is a need to strengthen legislation in India concerning telemedicine, as well as a virtual consultation. It is governed by a combination of the practice of medicine and information technology with their associated rules, regulations, or law. Specific laws governing the practice of telemedicines are needed to have clarity on legal issues and resolutions of technical issues. Regular assessment of quality standard in health related telecommunication is required. Yes, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nashat. Uh, Dr. Abdul Hamid Haraga, any question? But actually, I, I have uh, two uh, comments, yes. uh, if you please me. Uh, the first thing that I was amazed when, uh, when, doc uh, when uh, Dr. Nashat or Professor Nashat um, mentioned that the, the telemedicine started in India since 2003. Exactly. So, uh, it's a, lo a long time. I don't yes. know about the ad advanced advancing uh, or advancement in uh, establishing it yeah. exactly uh, even i was surprised to see the legislation which was being passed way back in 2003 from india on telemedicine act uh, the second point uh, I, I i strongly agree with you that uh, uh, one of the main points should be considered in the future about the legalization or the legal uh, points uh, about practice uh, acquisition and the other things to protect the doctors during uh, practicing this telemedicine. So I ag agree completely with you that we need, I think in most of our countries, we need to, to put, uh, um, put on ground uh, uh, or establish some legal points to protect the, uh, the, uh, the uh, health pra practitioners. Of when course. Yeah, we need to strengthen the legislation according to, and we need to balance the part of medical doctors as well as we need to take care of the rights of the patients. Of course. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was very nice uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, Dr. Nashat, if you allow me. Yeah, please. Uh, anybody, excuse me, from the participant, any question from the participants, they are welcome to put it in the chat box. We will ask the, the speaker if anybody is willing to ask. But for, for my, from my side, Dr. Nashat, my question, you mentioned that the smartphone is utilized for communication and telemedicine. Yes. And I believe the uh, smartphone now is, uh, you know, it, it's uh, our twin in life. Uh, which make it easy to access, easy to pass. And um, I'm not sure is it good or bad to have thousands of applications and apps in our Google Store or, uh, or Apple Store. But my question is, uh, what was the experience of utilizing uh, so a smartphone applications for telecommunications with the doctor? How, how, how valuable? Because, yes. you know, 
it is not, it's, it's, it's you know, some limitation. Sometimes you need to, uh, to authenticate the other side. You need to uh, bill him. You need to, uh, maybe the insurance company needs some documentation. So it's, it sounds good, perfect, but how, how, how practical it is. Yes, uh, at least from my context uh, from India, as I'm being in a very reputed institute that is All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And in the COVID time, we, uh, my hospital, we do practice and all the smartphones were procured and were supplied to all the clinicians, physicians. And we had a specific time where we can have, we uh, publicized the uh, numbers and the appointment was given to the patients and it was a wonderful experience overall. Uh, none of the, because it was a very severe pandemic situation, uh, we didn't uh, had any kind of untoward experience where uh, means any kind of litigations or allegations were made upon the doctors. As such, it was a, a good, wonderful experience from the point of the medical doctors, as well as from the point of the patients. Uh, did you practice any smartphone applications for surgical patients? No. We, it was uh, a consultation only, not for the surgical uh, treatment like that. And do you have any, what, what, what do you think about surgical telemonitoring? Surgical, sir, with the advancement of robotic surgeries, Though I'm not a competent person to answer on this because the surgeons are well, uh, they are the right person to answer on this. But at least uh, because what we see is the advancement of robotic surgeries nowadays, to some extent and cert certainly it will definitely help the rural surgeons who is not well uh, accentuated to the recent advances in that scenario. And nowadays we also see in the newspaper, specifically with the head surgeries, CNS surgeries, where the telecommunications are being used, expertise of a surgeon from another countries are also being used. I think to a certain extent, definitely, if we satisfy all the legal obligations, it can be used. Yes, I'm audible. Dr. Harvey? Yes. Any, any questions? Yes. Yeah, any question, please. Uh, we can move to the next speaker, Dr. Khadija. Thank you very much, Dr. Nashat. It was very... Uh, very uh, beautiful presentation, informative, well designed. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Khadija. Uh, yes, assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Dear, uh, just let's, let's welcome uh, Dr. Khadija. She is interpreter and uh, well experienced person. She has uh, a lot of research fellow and PhD candidates. Welcome, Dr. Khadija. You can start. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, well, yes, I'm a um, uh, research nurse and a PhD candidate from uh, Florence, Italy. And uh, uh, thank you to the organization to, for this talk because it's uh, very important to um, uh, divulgate, disseminate uh, what uh, we are doing here in our context. I'm from the rheumatology unit, so um, we treat and we deal with uh, rheumatology and the musculoskeletal disease. Uh, they are, uh, we can, uh, we can see. We can say 
almost uh, uh, chronic diseases, but also we have uh, acute and uh, very disabling conditions. Uh, the um, pandemic, the COVID pandemic, uh, in our co in our context, has uh, we can say that has taught us uh, something and to change uh, our clinical practice. Uh, indeed, uh, telemedicine is now part of our uh, practice. The slides. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes. The slides uh, just moved. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Um, the agenda for uh, my talk is uh, just a few words about uh, um, the key role of, of the strategies uh, that are based on type control and treat to target for musculoskeletal and rheumatic diseases. Well, we did the, we performed a survey um, based on the patient's experience. Then we performed an SLR, a systematic literature review, the, thus we have preliminary, preliminary results. And uh, in the end of the, at the end of this presentation, I'll share with you uh, what uh, we are doing in clinical practice and how uh, telemedicine is uh, helping us to follow up patients, to follow, follow up uh, for uh, uh, rheumatic patients. Uh, as you all know, um, rheumatic diseases are various diseases. They are uh, they are um, uh, the, the most common condition in rheumatoid arthritis. There are lots of other conditions such as connective tissue diseases, uh, negative arthropathies, uh, also mechanical and degenerative uh, conditions, and other that are uh, different. Uh, the problematics and the um, that are caused by these diseases uh, needs uh, a multidisciplinary team, not only the rheumatologist, but uh, and, uh, uh, the nurses uh, of the outpatient or inpatient clinic, but also other specialists, such as the, uh, the cardiologist, uh, the surgeon, uh, the pneumologist, and so on, because they are uh, systemic uh, diseases. Uh, uh, why the chronicity is important uh, and uh, how telemedicine uh, was uh, uh, relevant for this condition. Uh, when we treat this condition, uh, at first uh, we have uh, the, the objective, the aim to uh, induce remission, in particular for, um, uh, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, before the joint damage is, uh, is there, we have to, um, uh, to give the patient intensive treatment to induce the remission. Then uh, after this, uh, the condition is still chronic, there is no cure, so we need the maintenance of remission. And uh, for the maintenance of remission, we need the, the patient's adherence to the plans, uh, to the therapeutic plans and also the safety and efficacy drugs that we are giving to our patients. If the condition is uh, stable and uh, there is uh, remission or uh, low disease activity, uh, we can start uh, talking about uh, uh, de-escalation. So we can start, we can stop uh, some types of uh, treatments and uh, uh, when we have uh, combinations of treatments, we stop some and we continue with others, so on. We have to um, uh, tailor all the treatment um, uh, for, for the patients that, that we have, uh, that we are treating. Each patient is unique. Uh, as we can uh, see in the literature, the options for treatment are uh, that are now available are uh, um, a major advance, and also they are um, there are very uh, how we can say uh, there is lots uh, uh, lots of um, options of. Um, uh, of drugs, uh, from biological drugs uh, to synthetic drugs uh, and so on. So the importance uh, of the treatment to have remission is that we consider all the patient's characteristics and the disease characteristics to uh, achieve the remission or low disease activity. 
uh, we talk about uh, three to target. Three to target has been established as a guiding principle, principle uh, for the treatment of arthritis in general. Uh, this therapeutic strategy encompasses uh, several uh, distinct elements, such as uh, the shows of the target and uh, a method for measuring it, the assessment of the target at a pre-specified uh, time point in order to uh, compare it with the, uh, the follow-up uh, measurements and uh, in case it is necessary, um, considering uh, the changing of the treatment if this is not, uh, if the target is not achieved. Clearly, it's, uh, it is based on shared decision making, and this shared decision making uh, needs to consider the, the patient's uh, beliefs and the patient's need, needs. Uh, the three to target, uh, we can say that uh, leads uh, to superior outcomes uh, when compared to standard of care. Uh, in fact, there is uh, lots of uh, literature and evidences uh, uh, available. And the uh, EULA, that is um, the European Society uh, for um, Rheumatic Diseases, uh, for rheumatology, endorses the, 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 this type of strategy, of strategy as a fundamental therapeutic and uh, strategy for um, arthritis. There are lots of uh, studies uh, that have, uh, have the demonstrated the, um, the importance of uh, and the differences between uh, the three to target and uh, other uh, standard uh, uh, and the control group. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this was a little uh, introduction about the, what, uh, what types of what type of patients we are dealing with. Uh, we asked them um, after the first wave of the pandemic, uh, we were interested in their um, condition and if something changed, uh, clearly something changed because of the pandemic, but uh, from the um, uh, organizational and uh, logistic point of view, uh, we uh, tried to uh, shift all the we can say uh, not urgent problems uh, during the first lockdown. All, all uh, the inpatient and the outpatient uh, clinic was uh, shifted to telemedicine at first uh, or, uh, or just postponed. So the, the um, repercussion on, on patients were, were uh, very important, uh, also in terms of uh, um, disease activity. Uh, we did this online survey uh, in uh, last year. Uh, clearly, as uh, the um, rheumatology uh, population, they were prevalently, our respondents were prevalently female patients, and uh, most of them had rheumatoid arthritis, uh, as you can see. Uh, we asked uh, about um, family members, uh, if they had a caregiver, how, uh, what type of works, uh, of jobs they, they had, and uh, if uh, uh, something changed in the in the working life, and clearly uh, something changed. Some, um, Thirty percent answered that uh, they uh, continued to work, while the others uh, they shifted to smart working or they just uh, stopped to work because uh, they were worried about their situation. Uh, we asked if uh, was if they reported a worsening of the symptoms, and almost uh, uh, six percent of our respondents uh, agreed that uh, during uh, this period uh, their condition, the rheumatic condition, the rheumatic condition uh, worsened for various reasons, clearly, and also the. Um, uh, psychological uh, aspect was important indeed, the stress, uh, the worry, or also a sense of abandonment from the, uh, the rheumatology center were reported in almost 60% uh, uh, of, uh, of the patients. Uh, 
uh, the main issues that were reported was the cancellation or the postponement of uh, the visit from the deumatology uh, visit that uh, they were waiting for. Uh, they had also difficulty in finding pharmacological therapies. Uh, we, they, um, they, uh, the reference center was closed because it was shifted, it was transformed in a COVID center. And uh, they also had difficulty in access uh, to the center, to the reference center for a rheumatology consultation for various reasons. Uh, we asked them if uh, they uh, experienced telemedicine, uh, such as uh, online consultation or uh, video or telephone, or for example, email prescriptions for therapy. Uh, and uh, the 50% uh, of responders answered that uh, uh, they didn't know anything about this type of, uh, of um, health uh, care uh, delivery, uh, while uh, the other half uh, answered that uh, they, uh, they experienced this type of online consultation, email, or all, also online educational sessions for self-management, but uh, they, um, they were not used before the pandemic. So only 25% uh, um, used uh, these uh, healthcare services uh, delivery uh, during the pandemic. Uh, also, almost all the participants, 97%, uh, reported that uh, telemedicine is clearly a useful um, tool to uh, to integrate to usual care for uh, with the objective you can say to reduce the fee of the in-person consultation to um, integrate it with the in-person consultation to allow a more comprehensive care and uh, they agreed that uh, this type of uh, um, Telehealth care should clearly be organized and structured, not as uh, it was done uh, during the pandemic. Uh, then we performed a systematic review to search in the literature about the um, telemedicine, its use in the rheumatology field. Uh, these are the types of tele telehealth uh, tools that are used as uh, um, the doctor before me um, clearly explained it and uh, um, us. Yes, how telemedicine is used in patient care. We, in Italy here, we uh, have uh, also um, telemedicine tools are used also from clinician to clinicians. So if uh, there are, for example, for uh, the rheumatology um, field, uh, which is a, a very uh, specific field and also uh, um, with uh, lots of rare diseases, uh, for example, an expert uh, can um, perform a consultation with another clinician from uh, in other region of Italy or from uh, the territory, if uh, it is necessary. Otherwise, uh, there is a classical, a classic uh, clinician consultation. Uh, this is the type of uh, telemedicine that actually we don't use. Indeed, it is important to uh, to mention it because uh, when we deal with the uh, cardiology patients or uh, the pathology patients and so on. There are also wearable devices that are, um, that are um, helping us with the medicine and the patients can use the app, uh, an application with the smartphone or with the tablet to um, to fill uh, all the data uh, and uh, uh, to uh, take, we can say, take 
risk of uh, his uh, health condition during uh, the period that uh, he is not on visit. You can say so the, from the follow up to another. Uh, in rheumatology patients are a little different. So we have uh, uh, all these uh, particular drugs, uh, all uh, the uh, potential adverse effects that has uh, to be considered, and uh, patient education is important. Uh, and uh, we we thought which role uh, is there for patients monitoring uh, for telemedicine in uh, in the rheumatology field? These are some of the of the of the literature of the yes article that uh, I've been uh, reading, and uh, we can see that uh, yes, a, a name was coined, a telereumatology. It was all, actually it was coined uh, before the pandemic in uh, 2017 from uh, the author Ziad and uh, because it is the telemedicine and rheumatology. So uh, this uh, type of uh, follow-up and patient monitoring started before the pandemic, but the pandemic, as in other conditions, uh, give, gave the, the opportunity to, um, um, we can say, to uh, structure and uh, um, organize it in a, in a better way. Um, in RMDs, we said that uh, there is a few articles, and uh, in the last two years, as you can see, 2020-2021, the literature on telemedicine developed exponentially. So, uh, all over the world, they started to grow, to write, and uh, um, uh, develop uh, projects on telemedicine. Uh, this, uh, I, I guess there are some questions. I don't know if uh, we we leave comments and questions to the end or uh, it's the we we'll leave it to the end, doctor. We we'll leave it to the end. Okay, okay. Uh, this uh, was the population exposition and outcome, the PO for my uh, um, systematic literature review. Uh, I was looking for the role of uh, telemedicine in particular and telemonitoring and the digital uh, health and so on um, to answer this uh, question. Uh, for for um, telemedicine uh, and if disease activity, satisfaction with the care, quality of care, self-management, self-efficacy and treatment adherence, of patients have been exposed to intervention with telemedicine or uh, telehealth. We, there, is, there are uh, some inclusion criteria, as you can see. Uh, I uh, searched these um, four databases, the, the most important for uh, uh, primary literature, not uh, reviews, clearly. And uh, this is the, the flow chart from the identification to the full text inclusion, uh, where we have we included the final full text papers, uh, uh, 19 final full text papers to review. Uh, our preliminary results show that uh, um, the variety of intervention applied uh, to healthcare technologies. Uh, uh, reports, uh, web-based application, telehealth, uh, phones, telephones, uh, telephone calls, uh, or video calls, which are different, uh, and also smartphone apps. Um, so uh, the types of intervention are, uh, we couldn't uh, um, reach a, a conclusion uh, uh, to say if something is better than something else, because uh, uh, it is uh, a, a new field uh, of exploration, and uh, the studies that we explored also um, focused on uh, different outcomes. So uh, it was not possible to reach a conclusion. However, uh, we uh, we found uh, this type of intervention, and we can say we, we can say that uh, also in practice, 
uh, almost uh, uh, four of them are used. Also, the, only the smart for application is not used at the moment as something recognized from the, the hospital. If a patient wants to use a smart for application, it's uh, his choice. Otherwise, all the others, so web-based content, telehealth, phones, and video calls are all used to implement and integrate our clinical practice. So what are we doing in uh, clinical practice and how uh, we choose to uh, implement uh, um, the, the follow-up the follow and, the and the monitoring of our patients? There is a program, it's called Dedicare, uh, which, uh, um, uh, has, uh, um, which is a patient support program, uh, a web-based platform for disease management with the aim to engage patients, to empower patients, and not, not only the patient, but also the family and the caregiver. Uh, the main objective is to use telemedicine and tight control because we said that uh, in uh, chronic conditions such as uh, uh, rheumat rheumatic conditions, it is important to uh, tightly uh, follow up with the patients and. Uh, uh, monitor their labs, uh, lab tests, their condition, their, their pain, and their adherence to treatment in order to achieve the remission or the low disease activity. The uh, interface of the, of the application uh, where we, uh, we have a clinician use and also patient use. Mm -hmm. So with the login, it is something that uh, you, you need to register, you need your identification to uh, identification data uh, to, uh, to log in. It's not, uh, it's not a, a website. And then you can fill out uh, lots of data. Uh, when we perform a televisit and teleconsultation with the patient, we have uh, the, uh, sorry, this is in Italian. We have uh, um, all the lab tests such as transaminases, uh, uh, the uric acid, the um, ESR, the PCR, uh, the, um, uh, and, and others that are important to track the um, disease activity of the, of the patients. Then we have um, questionnaires about uh, patient adherence, uh, what type of diagnosis and treatment uh, the patients un are undergoing at the moment, and if there are uh, comorbidities, so other diseases that are important and might influence uh, or impact the, the treatment and the, uh, the outcome of the, of the disease. Uh, this, uh, this platform is, uh, was originally uh, studied for rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and uh, spondyloarthritis, but uh, at this moment, uh, they are implementing it for all the other diseases. Uh, indeed, when we fill out the questionnaire, then we have, uh, we can say, um, a tra um, like a traffic light with the uh, each uh, questionnaire uh, has a, um, clearly a, a cutoff for uh, uh, urgent problems, uh, not urgent but to monitor, or remission or low disease activity. And as you can imagine, the remission, remission or low disease activity is uh, reported by green, uh, the green light. We have, uh, um, um, we can say that uh, when we enter the patient's uh, page, uh, we have this, uh, this, um, this, uh, this graph where these graphics were uh, in during uh, the last year, the last few years, we can see all the, um, uh, the, the outcomes of, uh, its, uh, of his or her um, follow-ups and how is uh, the um, the disease going? So we can say that uh, if there is a, a a worsening of the of the condition or not. Uh, 
in our context, uh, we chose to um, uh, from the first uh, visit consultation that is in person, uh, we chose to enroll some of the patients with particular characteristics and uh, to uh, enroll them uh, to the telemedicine program. So not all patients are enrollable because of the eligibility criteria. Uh, and also because of the health literacy, they, they cannot uh, use, they don't have uh, a smartphone, they cannot uh, fill out uh, all these questions, they don't understand <clears throat> the Italian language is not uh, their native language, so you have to talk to them and uh, all, only for phone calls, for example, uh, are possible with this type of, of, the, of, uh, of patients and so on. The important thing is that uh, we noticed that from uh, the first visit to the, the next one, uh, we, um, uh, we can see our patients once a year. It is uh, if they are stable or uh, with low disease activity, we can see them at the clinic, at the outpatient clinic on, only once a year. But in the meantime, it is important to maintain the uh, uh, adherence to therapy and to treatment. So um, that's because that's why we do a clinic and clinimetric evaluation performed by, by nurses, trained and, special, and specialized nurses, clearly. And uh, through this platform, we can see all the uh, ongoing uh, uh, outcomes for each patient. If there is something that is urgent or if there is a disease flare, clearly we schedule an urgent, an urgent appointment. Uh, either uh, a uh, urgent lab tests uh, to see if uh, the, the condition needs uh, a consultation or directly a specialist uh, and so aromatic aromatology consultation. Uh, the uh, we can see that uh, the, the aim of this novel approach in our context is reducing the waiting list for our patients. We have this problem all over Italy and uh, in particular in the um, secondary and tertiary uh, reference centers. Uh, so it's really important to reduce the, the waiting lists for patients. Also, uh, we have the possibility to early diagnose or uh, uh, to early uh, to an early diagnosis or also a disease flare, uh, so that we can um, uh, treat it in uh, in time, and uh, also improve the perceived quality of life and quality of care of the of the healthcare system in general. Uh, so, uh, trying to conclude this, this presentation, what are our uh, future perspectives, uh, in particular for nursing research, but uh, not only, clearly. There are lots of uh, pros and cons, clearly, for telemedicine, and they all need to be considered as uh, the, um, the speakers before me uh, introduced uh, the ethical and uh, legal uh, aspects of uh, this new uh, health delivery, it is important uh, to consider all of them, to consider patient content, to consider um, the, yes, the informed content uh, for, uh, for patients, uh, to consider the patient that we have uh, in front of us, uh, if the video is possible, if it's not possible, if some conditions are, uh, for example, if I have to do an examination of uh, the, the joints, it's not possible to do it uh, in, um, in telemedicine, so I, I need to see the patient. So uh, after all this uh, consideration, we can see that, uh, uh, we can say that uh, uh, telemedicine is uh, uh, something that we should integrate uh, through in-person care. And uh, in this uh, project, in particular in this project, uh, the nursing management of stable or low disease activity uh, was very successful with clearly the supervision of the rheumatologist. Uh, we 
uh, it uh, allowed us to monitor uh, to monitor the results and uh, in case it was needed to adjust uh, some therapies. Clearly, uh, there are no uh, structured clinical trials uh, to uh, assess this type of uh, of, uh, of of approach. So, uh, in the future, it might be interesting to uh, uh, to address uh, this uh, type of studies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalid. It's very Pleasant presentation. It's really nice. Uh, Dr. Haraga, are you? Do you have any question, please? Uh, no, actually, I, I just want to thank you here for uh, this uh, very detailed, informative uh, presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially and uh, especially the last uh, few slides, which uh, almost summarized the, uh, all the advantage, disadvantage of telemedicine and how to overcome the disadvantage in the future. Thank you much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, in, the, in the clinical trial, uh, Dr. Khadija, do you think that it's, uh, uh, you know, the ethical committee before you, uh, they uh, give you, sorry, one minute. Sorry, if you apply to the ethical committee asking for their approval, for a clinical trial for uh, telemedicine, did you encounter any issues about uh, the legal aspects or the patient security or something like that? Uh, I know I, Italy they are advanced in the clinical trials, but uh, I would like to know your opinion. Uh, actually, uh, in Italy, it's uh, the the region and the, the national health service that is uh, uh, encouraging us to uh, shift patients to telemedicine where this, when this is uh, possible. So I think there is no pro no no issues or problems with the um, ethical committee either. We are encouraged uh, the the. From also from the reimbursement point of view, it is uh, it is uh, well structured in Italy, so we we, we don't have problems from this point of view. So, but but what are the, the most common specialties that almost accepted now in Italy to go through? You know, I, I know, and you know, and everybody knows that after COVID nineteen things start to go back to normal life, but. There are still some people or some positions they are willing to uh, get the benefit. So, what do you think that in telemedicine will progress more and more despite uh, COVID nineteen is over? Yes, I agree with this. It's not easy to to perform after COVID nineteen. They try to go back to normality, but uh, the normality of uh, two thousand twenty one, two thousand twenty two, it's not the, the normality before COVID. So. Uh, also, the patients sometimes uh, the, the patients uh, for their annual visit they ask, uh, "Okay, I'm in a low disease activity. I'm quite well, but I need to see the rheumatologist. So I need to to go to the center. Uh, is there another way, or, or can we perform this from with telemedicine because it's easier for me?" I don't have to 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 lose the working days. I don't have to travel and so on. So also the patients are asking for this. It's uh, it's something that the, the, it is more beneficial for the patients than the clinicians. For us, it's uh, clearly lots of paperwork because to perform a thirty minute uh, visits, uh, televisits, teleconsultation or something similar. You need to prepare, you need before, you need to send uh, all, everything through email uh, to the patient and then you have work after the television. So it's not 30 minutes. While we, when you have the, the, the patients in person, if it's 30 minutes, it's 30 minutes. If it's more, you have the patient inside and all, all the delay of the of the outpatient clinic, but uh, the the patients clearly understood the, how beneficial this is to them, and uh, that uh, when integrated 
and uh, with the, the clinical practice, the standard clinical practice, it, uh, it can be very, very beneficial and important. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Khadija. Any question, Dr. Rasara? No, thank you. It's very informative and clear. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, we will really have good. a break for uh, 30 minutes for uh, Asr Prey uh, participants and speakers, and we'll be back after 30 minutes. Uh, admin, please transfer the host to me, please. So uh, we will be back after uh, 30 minutes uh, for uh, a sort of break.
السلام عليكم ويلكم باك اجين تو اور سيمبوزيوم وي ار وي ويل موف تو اور دكتوره دكتوره ساره موجوده معنا يس دكتور ام هير طيب شال وي موف تو ذا نكست برزنتيشن Uh, the next presenter will be Dr. Mohamed Al Harbi. Let's welcome <coughs> Dr. Mohamed Al Harbi. He's associate professor, consultant of general colorectal surgery, medical college at Imam Mohammed bin Saud University, and he exper has experience more than 15 years. Welcome, Dr. Mohammed. You can start. Thank you very much, Dr. Rasara. Uh, it's really nice to have uh, such talented uh, international speaker for today and also tomorrow and after tomorrow we'll have uh, more of the speakers uh, to discuss the issues related to telemedicine and telesurgery. Uh, our country actually needs a lot of uh, consideration and as uh, the CEO Dr. Abdul Aziz al Hamid, he mentioned that in the Hail region, we have the most areas, and uh, those areas will require some attention how to provide a proper healthcare uh, system with uh, the, the most accept, uh, acceptable and evidence based way, uh, which can overcome the geographic and logistic uh, issues. So, I hope this uh, meeting will support decision makers either in higher region or in other areas to provide uh, more solutions related to, uh, tele uh, related to patient care uh, by utilizing telemedicine or telesurgery. In the 19th centuries, uh, numbers of pressures has been increased and in the low and uh, middle-income uh, countries, there was a large uh, shouldering to the rise of the clinical uh, burden with restricted access to their population. And as um, our colleagues, Dr. Nashati mentioned that in 2003, the population uh, in um, India, they started the telemedicine and telesurgery. I believe nowadays it should be uh, more accessible and more easy. Centralization typically concentrates uh, specialized surgery and multiple hubs and unintended consequences of this restrictions to access surgery in rural areas. Our main concern now is how to provide the same service of the capital cities to the rural areas. And uh, I hope by end of this event, we can have a conclusion how to optimize this. In high income countries, centralization has being shown to improve the outcome across the number of conditions. But I have to put you in, in, uh, in your mind that uh, robotic surgery and almost two decades ago, they start to market that the robotic surgery would be able to provide the same healthcare system through surgeries to a remote areas. But um, I believe in our country, we need telesurgery more than robotic surgery for a lot of reasons that I can, I think that we'll discuss in the uh, next uh, uh, presentations. Telemonitoring in particular provide a unique solution to increase both the quality and access to surgical care. And uh, to be honest, we face some difficulties in some rural areas in uh, our country that uh, there are some challenges either uh, the, because the only way of uh, providing communication is through the cell phone. And uh, the telecommunication, it was 4G, now 5G in some areas, not in every place. But even that, uh, if you go to a building A or building B, you'll find good signals outside the building, but what you once you go inside, especially in rural areas, you'll find the signals are low. This, of course, I, I believe in the coming few years will be more focused to provide uh, the best uh, uh, communication process around the hospital. Telemedicine has previously been defined as the use of medical information exchange from one side to another via electric, electronic communications to improve a patient's clinical health status. The, the second question, how does it cost to provide telemonitoring? 
maybe it's uh, the, the robotic surgery doesn't have such a uh, course because uh, uh, until nowadays, most of the robotic surgery are, are done in the same hospital. There is no cost for telemonitoring. But if we provide the same service in a remote area, I believe there will be a cost. Uh, so if you go to United States, two studies reported uh, the yearly cost between 10,000 and 20,000 and initial setup cost, professional system where 75,000. In one study, it has been reported that the uh, one off cost was almost 2,750 for a self-created low cost system created using readily available equipments, including personal equipments and laparoscopy stack and the video capturing system. So how does it cost? There will be a direct cost and indirect cost. Uh, direct cost, these are the costs that are clear, obvious, like the travel cost, like the, uh, the, the, the uh, physicians and surgeons' uh, salaries, uh, like the bill, uh, like the tender that we have to pay to uh, uh, assigned companies. <clears throat> but there are indirect costs, like uh, the occupation, like uh, uh, logistic, like other things that sometimes are not properly counted. In one study reported of uh, one of cost of 2,750 all self-created low cost system. And it has been evolved like that. Uh, 12 separate studies directly compared the monitoring against uh, on-site monitoring. And I believe in our country, we uh, we have to focus on telemonitoring. On-site monitoring, despite in some studies, they showed it's uh, more effective and there is no major advantage. But in other studies, it has been shown that uh, telemonitoring provides more, um, uh, more benefits. Uh, uh, and uh, in the last, uh, Dr. Khadija mentioned also how does telemonitoring was helpful to provide uh, health services uh, through telemonitoring uh, to patients. Uh, almost 60% of studies showed, showed no difference in outcome. They found telemonitoring was uh, subjectively rated as inferior to on-site monitoring. And they found also telemonitoring to give a prolonged operative time and also found telemonitoring to be superior on on-site uh, monitoring. Robotic assisted laparoscopic radical prostatectomy is another procedure that has been counted or uh, assisted but uh, as I mentioned in the first slide, that robotic surgery, uh, despite it is uh, becoming international, because, uh, 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 perhaps uh, the issues that robotic surgery uh, escalating cost will provide more and more challenges. Uh, and one robotic surgery that we uh, did a uh, few months ago, uh, there was um, uh, Dr. Aron from India. He's one of the international figures in robotic surgery. And there was a major question, how does robotic surgery would be helpful in remote areas? Um, the message was that to have um, uh, a profitable or to have efficient robotic system, you must have a feasibility assessment. And to have the robotic system feasible, and um, uh, in, uh, either in your hospital or in uh, a remote hospital doing rural uh, surgery there, the, you, you must do 2,000 cases per two years. And I think this is important if you are doing a feasibility analysis to your hospital, how much is the robotic surgery profitable or uh, would be um, uh, feasible to practice robotic surgery, which means that you must do something like four cases or five cases per day the whole year. And I believe uh, such high volume is almost impossible to be done in our region. Uh, that's why we have to consider again the feasibility of the robotic surgery in um, the developing countries. A further study comparing the efficacy of on-site versus telemonitoring and robotic surgery found that on-site monitoring uh, was preferred by trainee. 
Uh, free text analysis of trainee response determined that the reason for the this difference was uh, mentors were unable to demonstrate movements with their hands during uh, telemonitoring. And multi-speciality uh, studies comparing clinical outcome have shown no difference between telemonitoring and traditional monitoring. In one study that, sh that showed that uh, uh, augmented reality telemonitoring reduced time taken to complete tasks from uh, uh, fundamental of laparoscopic skills. It didn't, uh, however, affect the number of errors committed by the participants. Both modalities significantly improved uh, uh, task performance and the economy of movements with no significant difference between either modality. <clears throat> Bariatric trainee surgeon within their learning curve when telemonitored using uh, uh, tele-rotation uh, had reduced operative time, length of hospital stay conversion, and post-operative complication rate compared to unmentored cases. Uh, but again, in such studies, we have to understand that the cost of bariatric uh, surgery uh, uh, through robotics is almost double uh, the price of laparoscopic cases. So if you check that the cost effectiveness and resource poor uh, settings, it was found that telemonitoring using AV increased the uh, fundamental laparoscopic skills performance scores of telemonitored participants in comparison with those who learned via self-practice. So we have to understand that the reduction of equipment cost uh, is coming through time and uh, through uh, more and more training. All surgeons who had telemetric support achieved full uh, fundamental laparoscopic uh, certificate compared to 40% of self-practice groups. Again, Google Glass has been utilized for telemonitoring. Uh, and uh, uh, I believe it is a good option despite it is not marketed well in the, uh, like other uh, companies. But I believe in one day that Google Glasses or similar glasses would be beneficial to transfer the uh, monitoring from one zone to another zone. And the other zone, it must, it should not be uh, in the same OR room uh, as you know. Telemonitoring improved confidence in trauma search. We face a lot of difficulties in trauma, but telemonitoring would be very helpful to trauma surgeon to be monitored from remote areas or remote hospital. So in Hail here, I believe, if we go to Hyatt Hospital or Shamley Hospital and there is a trauma, I would believe if we have a central station here in King Salman Hospital or King Khalid Hospital, uh, we, would have, we would be able to monitor that through telemonitoring. Remote surgical operations require both rapid and accurate transmission of formation. I believe in this slide or maybe the, I mean, in this lecture or the next lecture, we'll discuss the latency period or the latency time. The latency, latency time is quite essential to be assessed before surgery. And uh, our experiment showed that uh, to perform the first time remote robotic assisted surgery in humans, uh, we have to understand that uh, telemonitoring and robotic surgery uh, two decades ago is completely different than nowadays. Now we reach a stage of uh, 5G uh, cellular communication and where you would be able to transfer up to 10 gig per second. Uh, in the past, it was not impossible. Even the satellite communication in the past was not easy, which means that uh, it is expected that in the coming decade, they will have an outbreak, uh, I mean, I mean a, a breakthrough um, in the communication, which support the telecommunication and areas similar to Middle East countries. Uh, so this is an example of a patient who has a history of recurrent abdominal pain, right hypochondrium of gastric, who went underwent abdominal ultrasound for Goldstone. And after approval of ethical committee, there was a study was done. This study was done in 2002 decades ago, where they did the uh, procedure in a different place. So what they have done, uh, ZS system, that was the first trials of robotic, where the surgeon subsystem, there is, this is the council, 
uh, the, sorry, the Council of, of the Robotic System, which we have nowadays. It is, I believe, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, we have uh, eight or nine uh, Council for the Robotic Surgery, and I believe most of them are in Riyadh. And this study, which was 20 years ago, the variety of surgical instruments can be connected to the robotic arms. And you can see in, in, in this area that uh, this is the area of the robotic. You can see the council, which was in the last slide, the, the surgeon is a different case. And these are the councils like they do in NASA uh, uh, to start uh, such a procedure and 20 years ago was almost like an outbreak. Uh, sorry, it was like a breakthrough in the science because such technology was only utilized by NASA. So the network connection and uh, monitoring, the connection between New York and uh, Strasbourg in France, there was, they utilized uh, the asynchronous transfer mode uh, which is ATM technology at that time, but now I, I believe it is different, and I think it, it can be utilized by a different satellite system. But I have to remind you that uh, it is very important that the probability of having no network outage is almost 1%, 100%, which means that it is very um, safe to utilize such network to provide telecommunication. As you can see, the, the bandwidth, it was 10, mega, uh, 10 megabytes per second. The data flow assigned to each applicant was uh, 10 mega uh, per second virtual path because of specific services. The data coming from the two applications were merged and they received a guaranteed minimum rate of around 3 megabytes per second. The operator site was set up for non-medical building in Manhattan, and the surgeon in New York performed the dissection of the cystic duct and after the consistent well, the team in Strasbourg induced pneumoperitoneum. In Strasbourg, the surgical team monitored the procedure on a screen and was constant connection through the phone line with the colleagues in New York. The abdomen was uh, uh, insufflated and the incision was uh, done. Then after they completed the dissection, they closed the abdomen. The evaluation path was between uh, zero up to 10 scale. Zero is the worst and 10 is the best. The robot arm set up trocar placement was 16 minutes and the la la laparoscopic cholecystectomy was done in 54 minutes. The coordination of electric cutary, uh, which is, as you know, it is dangerous uh, material during surgery. Uh, we utilize it frequently, but with caution, of course was ordered by the surgeon in New York. The OAM tool found no ATM packet uh, uh, loss during surgery. And the three surgeons rated 10, the score perception of the safety of the operation. Uh, and uh, no instance throughout the operation was uh, there any risk of patient related to the uh, teletransmission or to the use of robot system. Two uh, and four weeks after surgery, the patient was seen in office by a surgeon and the patient has good wound healing. Enhancement of dexterity is accomplished by improving accuracy, precision, and endurance. And the robotic system have computer programs that filter out hand trimmers and shares up. Of course, the hand trimmers is one of the common issues that the surgeon faced during uh, either prolonged surgery or uh, uncomfortable position of the patient of the of the surgeon hands. Devices that cancel the physiologic tremor have been used uh, vitroretinal microsurgery, and this is one of the uh, benefits of the robotic surgery. But to be honest, uh, I believe it is too much augmented because uh, we utilized laparoscopy for a long time, and the issue of robotic is not a big issue during surgery. So we have to be very careful from over-emphasizing the trimmer factor. The group performed laparoscopic robotic resectomy in 25 patients with no uh, uh, ROPO-related complication. 
uh, robotic assistant has been used for laparoscopic nephrectomy also and uh, laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. Robotic system have also facilitated the performance of endoscopic cardiac surgery. There are several challenges involved, but the most important limitations have been the reliability or the quality of service of telecommunication lines uh, and the issue of latency, uh, the delay time from when the hand motion is initiated by the surgeon until the remote manipulator actually moves the image is shown on the surgeon monitor. So you have an afferent and efferent part. Due to the latency factor, it was uh, believed that the feasible distance for remote surgery when the latency approaching 1.5 seconds, but we'll discuss in the uh, next few slides that uh, it, we have a shorter uh, time more than this. So in, in the research that has been conducted, the 300 uh, milliseconds was the maximum time delay compatible with safe performance of the surgical manipulation, which means if you are going to ask for a device for telemonitoring or telesurgery, you have to consider that the time of latency, if it's exceeding 300 milliseconds, you may, you may face some difficulties. Uh, these results support the use of existing high bandwidth dedicated telecommunication lines for performing intercontinental surgery on humans with adequate efficacy and safety. There are several limitations. First, although backbone, the high-speed uh, radial ATM fibers, and as you know, we have fiber optic um, lines nowadays, which is quite fast, and also a wide band, uh, by, uh, a wide, uh, band width, also almost uh, approaching uh, 5G. So what are the applications of remote surgery? Benefits of remote uh, robotic surgery are multiple because of the ge geographical constraints. And areas in Saudi Arabia, like in Haïl, Gassim, uh, northern region, uh, maybe also the, the south area, uh, the south part of Riyadh, uh, Medina. We have multiple hospitals in remote regions that, that it, there are some challenges to recruit uh, a consultant there because of low uh, volume rate of patients. So it is not feasible to hire uh, physicians at that in those regions. So I believe that telesurgery and telemonitoring is quite important because you can handle uh, com more complex uh, conditions while uh, you are utilizing telesurgery and directing your staff in a different area. As you can see here that there is a, a doctor in Singapore and uh, the, the, the patient in Africa. So the, the latency period is quite important the audio and video stream and the remote control and the hepatic feedback data are quite essential. So in emergency uh, operations in small uh, rural hospitals are sometimes challenging for young surgeons. Unquote. The availability of network connection, uh, the hospital to a major center would allow expert surgeon to assist or carry the procedure themselves. In addition to all these uh, potential advantages uh, for uh, patients, active intervention from remote locations open new avenue for surgical educations. The assistance of experts may range from complete performance of procedure to the help of just exposure anatomical structures. As a result for this, this potential impact of training education, telesurgery might eventually improve standard of surgical care. So we have to consider telesurgery as an uh, adjunct to our training, to our either residents or our specialists to have a better uh, care of patients. Teleperformance in surgical operation require the expert surgeon to be familiar with robotic devices. And again, I have to remind you that uh, we are not uh, uh, in favor of, of robotic surgery because robotic surgery has its own indication and has own uh, area of discussion. We are discussing here telesurgery and teleperformance. Uh, although robotic surgery, uh, two decades ago, they market themselves for telesurgery, but unfortunately, that was not the, the fact all over the world. Uh, there is no doubt that remote telesurgery depends on robotic assistance and information technology and enhancement of human dexterity resulting from the use of robotic and performance and high precision tasks. 
So if closure remote robotic assistant telesurgery is feasible and safe using designated proper communication, the possibility of performing complex manipulation from a remote locations allow an expert surgeon to teach or proctor the performance of an advanced or new techniques by real-time interventions and actually eliminate the geographic constraints of obtaining high surgical expertise where this is required. So uh, any question from the audience, please? It's Thank very you, nice, Mr. It's very nice presentation, Dr. Harvey. Um, I think uh, the next one, telemonitoring of surgeons, is a very interesting topic because you mentioned that uh, this telemonitoring can be applied in higher region, especially in trauma. So I think you will put more stress and more light on this in the next uh, lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haraga. I agree with you. I think uh, uh, if we uh, invest more in, in, uh, in teaching and training uh, our staff how to, uh, how to monitor uh, trauma patients in remote uh, areas, it would be more appropriate, especially as you know, in Khalid uh, Hospital is one of the leader hospitals in higher region. And uh, they have a long experience about trauma. I guess one day uh, uh, King Khalid Hospital would be able to monitor trauma in the region through telemonitoring and telesurgery. Yeah. I agree with you totally. Thank you much. Any question from the audience? Okay, we'll move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, again, uh, telesurgery and robotics. Robotic surgery started in Saudi Arabia uh, around 2000, up to 2005. And there was a major uh, uh, difficulty to be accepted and uh, uh, surgical field in Middle East. And I believe uh, the, the first few days when they start to announce about the presence of robotic surgery, that, that you would be able to do a procedure in a different location, geographic location. That was the whole idea. Uh, but because of communication issues, it was not practical and it was not possible to do that. But in the same time, uh, robotic surgery has been utilized in, in the United States and the West, and it is escalating up, to be honest, getting more and more. Uh, the next question, uh, what do we need? Do we need telesurgery or do we need robotics in the Middle East and developing countries? And I believe this is the major question of this event. What do we need? Do we need to do surgery or do we need to robotic? And remote areas like Hyal region, the same region and the other areas. We have to answer this question, to be honest. And uh, uh, we did uh, two events, international events about robotic surgery last year and a few months ago. And uh, all of the speakers, the, the first event was uh, uh, accompanied and joined by uh, the Robotic Surgery Society, the American. Uh, and it has been, uh, the, the opening ceremony was done by Paul Battelle, which was the chairman of the Robotic Surgery Society in the United States. And most of the uh, 
uh, speakers were from the same society. And again, the question was, uh, are we getting higher cost by robotic or lower cost over time? The laparoscopy uh, uh, experience showed that it is getting higher and higher, where at one stage you will have some deficit in the budget and you won't be able to continue. So if you speak about <clears throat> the concept of telesurgery or remote surgery, the advent of robotic surgery made it possible for a surgeon to operate with increased diversity, improved accuracy, and a broader accessibility of difficult locations in the body such as pelvis. And I agree on that. But again, how the, the prostate surgery, the robotic prostate surgery is quite essential now and it is evidence-based that uh, robotic surgery is superior to laparoscopic surgery for uh, prostate surgery. Uh, the first tele-robotic surgery was successfully performed in patients in Strasbourg. And again, they are telling here, <clears throat> there is a major issue about definitions. If you are saying that telesurgery or uh, robotic surgery or telerobotic surgery, I believe robotic surgery from marketing perspective are pushing more and more to be as a part of telesurgery. Uh, telesurgery is more uh, umbrella. They have a bigger umbrella than robotic surgery alone. Uh, currently, we are living through a fourth industrial, uh, industrial revolution in the field of our lives and surgery. And the future of surgery is transforming with integration of new technologies such as fifth generation, uh, the 5G internet, artificial intelligence, hepatic feedback technology. Uh, we did one event a few months ago about artificial intelligence. And one of the speakers from France, he made something unique. Uh, he present how does artificial intelligence would be able to support the telesurgery and providing uh, analysis of the surgical steps and surgical <clears throat> and surgical techniques to know is the surgeon doing the right thing or not. That was a breakthrough to me. And I believe if we continue to put the artificial intelligence with uh, telesurgery and robotic surgery, and 10 up to 20, 20 years from now, the artificial intelligence would have an impact, a major impact in our uh, procedures. Uh, Telerobotic spinal surgery based on 5G network was performed in 20, uh, 12 patients <clears throat> in six hospitals from six different cities in China. And if the Chinese did the surgery utilizing 5G network. That means that we are in a new stage nowadays. Um, as you know, 2019, this uh, study was done. Then the COVID-19 comes after. Then nobody knows what happened. After. These 12 cases show that it's possible to provide minimal latency. Latency, latency, latency is the main issue of telesurgery. If it's less than 300 milliseconds, that means we are doing fine. If it's more, it means that we have to discuss other issues. But again, the high, the, the high uh, bandwidth and the reliable communication for medical services, services with uh, no telecommunication errors or network delay is the important issue. So what are the benefits? The advancement of telecommunication and robotic surgery have made telesurgery a promising and feasible option for patients to get treated without traveling much. Traveling for medical care is not a feasible option for many uh, uh, either because of financial constraints. And as Dr. Uh, Fatima said that uh, some patients, they prefer to have uh, telecommunication uh, uh, instead of coming to the hospital because it's uh, easier, cheaper, and uh, it is preferable to patients more than the surgeons or the physicians themselves. 
telesurgery is an excellent solution to get medical attention without patients need to travel beyond their local hospitals. And I agree on that. The 3D camera allows surgeon to see the close-up view of the surgery. It is almost like the 3D camera of the new virgin cars. You would be able to see everything from all directions. Uh, accelerometer technology is useful to cancel out surgeon's physiological tremors. So this is almost have the same function which is available in robotic uh, concept. As you can see here that, in short, patient can have faster recovery, fewer complications. This is a Da Vinci uh, concept for robotic surgery where the surgeon in location and the, the patient in a different location. The coronavirus disease, COVID-19, caused by SARS, declared the global pandemic, as you know. Telesurgery is a viable option for the protection of both the surgeon and the patient, but unfortunately, it was not mature enough at that time. Global network development, legal issues, has been discussed in the previous presentation by our colleagues. Billing issues. Uh, still, we don't have feasibility study of how much it will cost to have uh, such technology uh, through the communication bill. Equipment acquisition, how much cost? Uh, as you know, it is a new modality of treatment, and we have to know how much it costs before we go. The latency up to 200 milliseconds is known to be accepted. However, some physicians and some researchers, they said up to two seconds, we have no problem because uh, we can have some a backup. Two, two, two seconds will result in unacceptable and inaccurate and effective. Even one of the most experienced utility operator is performing further highlighting is the importance of this variability in telesurgery. So we must have a universal international agreement about the acceptable latency for telesurgery or uh, surgical monitoring through telesurgery. Uh, As you can see here that cybersecurity threat has been mentioned by Dr. Uh, our doctor that uh, from uh, uh, in, the, in the last uh, uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Nashat, that uh, cybersecurity is a concern. Hacking also is, is another concern. If you are going to deal with internet communication, you have to consider the cyber attack. So what is the proposed approach? High-speed 5G network, theoretically maximum speed up to 10 gigabyte per second, which is more potent than uh, uh, almost 100 uh, times more than the 4G. The high-speed 5G internet cooperation with telesurgery will reduce the current latency period from 0.27 up to 0.01. So if we really have 5G, that's mean we don't have a problem. But I believe not all areas in the country are covered by 5G signals. So, hepatic feedback and tactile robotics. Let's move to uh, this video. Uh, the hepatic technology allows transmission of tactile information to reach the operator because of the invention of artificial intelligence. A new augmented and virtual reality surgery training program can cause these technologies to improve the robotic arm. Victor, it's not present to us. Sorry, no voice. We are just hearing. No videos. No video. One minute. Uh, 
One minute. الصوت والفيديو كان واضح السابق هو الصوره كانت واضحه لكن ما في فيديو ما في صوت 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 ما كانش واضح طيب دقيقه بسوي له عيادة.其实武器呢就是让我们可以做到在很多场合比如说救灾的场合还有一些像边防上还有一些呢就是说像我们将来的基层和大型医院的连接我们完全可以做到就是让外科医生做到一个标准化的素质一个人可以去做几千公里或者
the instruments with increased degree of freedom uh, greatly enhance, enhance the surgeon ability to manipulate instruments, and thus this is the main issue. And uh, these systems are designed that the surgeon tremor can be compensated on the end of a vector motion. But I have to remind you again that the tremor issue is uh, overemphasized because not all surgeons, they will have a tremor, and not all cases will have a tremor, especially if we have the proper instruments. As you can see here, that there are advantages and disadvantages of laparoscopy compared to robotic. If you see the advantages, that 3D visualization for the robotic surgery, and uh, they, as you see that, they put it the telesurgery as part of the robotic. But again, I have to focus that the telesurgery is a bigger umbrella than a robotic surgery. It's not the same. Uh, micron response is possible by robotic, I agree, but again, this is if the council is be, be beside the patient. All the robotic surgery are almost done, the council is beside the patient. So what is the major advantage more than uh, laparoscopic? And, um, from my perspective, there is no major advantage. And uh, the, the, the major uh, issue that the cost, the cost is too much. The cost of the robotic is almost three times laparoscopy. And almost the council is almost costing something like uh, 2.5 or 2 uh, million US dollar. And the disadvantage of uh, of of uh, the robotic is that, that it's very expensive. We know that, but the issue is it getting higher and higher costs or lower and lower costs. I believe it is going higher and higher. So what are the advantages versus conventional surgery? Uh, if you go to human uh, strength and limit, uh, limitation, robotic, uh, either strength and limitation, you'll find that a lot, most of the, of the discussion is about the robotic, it's better, it is uh, geometric, it is scale motion, it is fancy, it is the, 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 uh, the optimal care, but the, the, the most important question, I believe, if this is question number two, I believe the, the most important question or question number one, who is going to afford it? So the, the, the financial aspect is quite, quite uh, important, uh, especially in the United States that robotic is acceptable option by the uh, insurance healthcare system, but it's not acceptable in other healthcare system in other areas of the world. Uh, uh, we have presented by uh, by uh, modified radical mastectomy through ro to, through robotic last year by one of the uh, major uh, big surgeons from Italy, and he presented those those cases. So I believe robotic is getting more and more expansion uh, from academic and from fancy surgical perspective. But the next question: Who is going to afford it? especially if it's getting higher and higher. Uh, as you know, most of the countries, they have constraints about, uh, about the healthcare uh, uh, cost. And in some countries, there is a major conflict and challenge between the health insurance companies and the healthcare provider. So we have to be careful for while discussing these issues from higher perspective. With the surgeon settings in remote areas, a designated workstation, the current system uh, also eliminates the need for twist and turn uh, and turn in a weakened position. This is for the robotic and of course, all this creates an image of the increased resolution. But again, uh, uh, the setup, the training, the cost, all of this must be counted as we spoke in the last uh, presentation, direct and indirect cost. So the, uh, the, with a, pr a price of tag of a million dollars, the cost is nearly prohibitive, while the price of these systems will fall to rise in a matter of uh, conjecture. And they believe that improvement in technology as more experienced surgeon is gained with the robotic system and the price will, will fall. Another disadvantage is the size of these systems. Both systems have relatively large footprint and relatively cumbersome robotic arms. You must have a big operating room. In many hospitals here in Saudi Arabia, there are community hospitals. Their operating rooms are quite small. So it is impossible to do uh, such 
uh, technology in the in the uh, in the area in some uh, most of the areas of course. However, the transit disadvantages because of new technologies have all developed to address these shortcomings. Most of the disadvantages identified will be uh, reminded uh, remedied uh, with a time and improvement uh, of with technology. Uh, other laboratories are working on improving uh, current methods and developing new devices for suture less anastomosis. Doing so, allow them to capture more healthcare market, acquiring surgical robots in the sense of entry-free marketing and institution, institution surgical specialties the most advanced. As far as ideas and sciences, surgical robotics is a deep, fertile soil. It may come to pass that robotic systems are used very little, but the technology they are generating and advanced in the ancillary products will continue. This low number of machines and the low number of surgeons trained to use them makes incorporation of robotics and routine surgeries will be rare. So in conclusion, Although still in its infancy, robotic surgery has already proven uh, itself to be of great value, particularly in areas of uh, an accessible conventional laparoscopic procedure. It remains to be seen, however, if robotic systems will replace conventional laparoscopic instruments and less technically demanding procedure. In any case, robotic technology is set to revisualize surgery by improving and expanding laparoscopic procedure, advancing surgical technology, and bringing surgery to a digital area. Furthermore, it has the potential to expand surgical treatment modalities beyond the limits of the human ability. Whether or not the benefit of its usage overcome the cost to implement remains to be seen and much remain to worked out. Further, research must evaluate cost effectiveness or a true benefit over conventional therapy of robotic surgery to take a full route. I believe that was uh, the, the, the last um, the slide. Any question, Yahwan, Aiswan? Thank you, Dr. Dr. Haraga, anybody from the audience? Islam, Dr. Harb, a very nice presentation. Uh, if there are no questions, we will move to um, to the next presentation. I believe the next presentation will be about uh, telesurgery perspective in delivering health care in remote areas. I hope that it will be interesting to you. Uh, again, uh, communication, communication, communication this is the most important part of telesurgery. If you solve the issue of tele of communication, you will be able to provide uh, a better uh, care because you would be able to transfer the the uh, the data from one area to another. So we uh, hope that the 5G uh, internet would be able to uh, spread rapidly in uh, all areas in, in the uh, country or in surrounding countries. The combination of rapid telecommunication and advancement of uh, robotic surgery or led to telesurgery. 
which is a feasible option. The feasibility and safety performing robotic was first established. And again, I have to remind you that most of the literature and most of the discussion uh, are related to robotic surgery. And again, I have to remind you again that the telesurgery is the umbrella of robotic, which means that if we are going to discuss about robotic, there is no robotic surgery without discussing the telesurgery, which is the higher hand. And uh, uh, there was a successful cholecystectomy was performed in Strasbourg while the operator uh, in New York, and we discussed that um, in the last presentation, and that was uh, almost two decades ago, but now I think we are approaching a higher level. And uh, uh, the main time lag during uh, procedure uh, which was done by Professor uh, Jacques uh, and his team and the research cancer of digestive and they performed uh, cholecystectomy in 55, uh, 54 minutes uh, lend drug uh, operation. And the time lag or the latency time was uh, 155 millisecond, which was uh, uh, almost uh, cannot be detected by human eye because it's too short. This is almost uh, 0.1 second, which means that you won't be able to detect it. The demonstration of feasibility of transatlantic procedure uh, adopted operation, Landberg is richly symbolic milestone. Uh, in Italy, uh, that the globalization of surgical procedure making it possible to imagine that the surgeon could perform an operation on a patient anywhere in the world because of this uh, latency period. The surgeon at a distant location can have variable level of involvement depending upon clinical and educational needs. And telemonitoring, again, uh, if we are going to speak about telesurgery, we have to speak about telemonitoring and the supervision of surgical procedures. If you are working in a remote or a rural area, you require some monitoring somehow from somebody. And um, uh, telestration is the form of telemonitoring in which the uh, mentor remotely illustrate and then in wait on a monitor that's visible to the operating uh, room. And these geographical instructions overlaid on the real time uh, picture of the operative field. This is important that uh, the real time training safety or the robotic surgery training, uh, safety and feasibility of telemonitoring has been demonstrated via some observational studies. Uh, although uh, robotic surgery owing to magnify the view, augmented reality and improved ergonomic and externity uh, has revolutionized the minimally invasive procedure and training. So what is hepatic feedback technology? It enables the transmission of tactile information to the teleoperator. This is what we call it, hepatic feedback. You will feel the tactile sensation of the uh, other patient that you are doing through uh, special uh, uh, equipments. And doing the operation with hepatic feedback is crucial as it allows the surgeon to feel the consistency of the tissue and hence force the instruments is adjusted accordingly. An early uh, tactile sensation was carried out uh, relying solely on visual feedback. The first uh, tactile sensation prototype that implemented hepatic feedback technology was uh, done, was maintained by uh, Telelab Alpha X and it was introduced in 2015 in Italy. It was successfully reduced the average time of experimental cholecystectomy by 60 minutes. So what are the benefits? Because of the telerobotic surgery operates through robotic surgical system, also take advantage of all existing benefits of general uh, robotic surgery. These benefits include increased uh, dexterity, more natural hand-eye movements, than traditional laparoscopic surgery filtering the hand, the trimmer, customizable sensitivity setting, and in addition to benefits of robotic surgery as described above, operating at a distance can be beneficial in other areas as well. The, uh, in a relatively short amount of time, robots have 
made its way into general and subspecialty surgical field. In 2003, a fourth robotic arm was added in the Vinci uh, S mode model came in 2006 and offered improved robotic uh, arm movements. In 2009, the latest model called the Vinci SI uh, and now offers dual concept. So two individuals can collaborate simultaneously. Control vision ergonomic have been improved as well. In 2010, Intuitive Surgical Corporation, manufacturer of Da Vinci, reported that over 70% of robotic procedures were for both prostatectomy and hysterectomy. In gynecology, it is estimated that over 60% of minimally invasive hysterectomies performed in patients with endometrial cancer were done robotically. Robotic options uh, do exist for surgical treatment and other specialties, although it is used much less frequently. This include cardiothoracic surgery for cases uh, of coronary bypass and heart defects repair. It cannot be emphasized enough that robotic surgery is a relatively young feat. And the use of robotic in surgery began in 1985, when a group of neurosurgeons were able to perform biopsies with a machine they called Puma 560. The idea of using robots to perform remote operations, otherwise known telesurgery, first came about early 1990s. Other breakthrough depends happened shortly thereafter in 1988. The first robotic transurethral prostate resection using the same system was accomplished. The goal was to make the surgeon feel as if he or she operated directly on a patient, even though they were located elsewhere. The idea uh, caught the attention of US Army and US Army surgeons who hoped to develop systems for remote operations who wounded soldiers under the direction of surgeon who would be located in a safe zone. In 1995, a company called Intuitive Surgical from uh, Pennsylvania, they start to uh, market for this. A surgeon from Belgium first utilized the the device in 1997. Robotic surgery have been branched uh, out into a uh, non-scale level. Surgeons have uh, ability to uh, program and control these devices remotely. So the nanorobotics has provided oncologists with enhanced magnetic resonant imaging, improved drug delivery system for often toxic chemotherapy agents, and precise in vivo targeting and elimination of tumor cells. Further, nanorobots have shown usefulness in tissue engineering and organ transplantation. Such composites have uh, been utilized in endothelial uh, regeneration and bone replacement. Synthetic graft composed of carbon uh, nanotubes poses uh, remarkable mechanical strength and uh, thrombotic resistant properties. Telerobotics, since then advances in communication have enabled telesurgery to be performed in civil operations across cities, states, and even countries. This has allowed experienced surgeons from around the world to practice on patients without the need for the patient to come to them. The first intercontinental robotic surgery, telesurgery case was performed in 2001 and involved a surgery in New York. Although costly, telesurgery offers offer several worldwide health advantages in the long run. For example, providing advanced surgical care to rural and, and the underserved population is now possible. Also, surgeons in training can benefit by distance learning from highly skilled practitioners employed in the latest technique. For example, once four robotic arms on the latest Da Vinci model can be programmed so that it is being controlled by different surgeons in a different location. Perhaps the major drawback on robotic surgery is its cost. Cost analysis have been shown that robotic surgery is more expensive than laryngoscopy or conventional open surgery. However, a recent study involving 12 most common gastrointestinal procedure showed that the total hospitalization cost of the robotic approach is actually less than the laparoscopic or open approach through procedural cost 
were higher depending on the type of surgery being performed. This analysis have also identified longer operation time as a reason behind the higher cost. However, a more and more surgeon become trained and proficient uh, in robotic techniques operating time is expected to shorter. This growth will steadily lower the price of the uh, robot time. And another study suggests that cost can be minimized by increasing the number of robotic cases performed. Robotic surgery is not without controversy. As of now, there are no other uh, competitors for uh, uh, such device. Further critiques state that advantages of using uh, robots is often exaggerated. And there is a lack of objective scientific studies that showed robotic surgery is better, particularly in the field of general surgery. Most of the published data of robotic surgery outcome uh, are for radical prostatectomy, which have shown only marginal clinical benefit. However, as mentioned previously, reduced length of hospital stay and the increase in number of procedures performed will compensate for the cost in long run. Also, as a patent uh, expire, the manufacturer from around the world are expected to join the market. Tool robotic procedure also bring forth other uh, ethical issue. Patient confidentiality has been taken into account when communicating electronically. Medical liability can be another complicated issue. All parties involved, including surgeons, patients, hospital equipment, company knows, uh, needs to prepare alternative approach in the event of rare but hospital systems failure. Opponents argue, although that this, is, this will result in the migration of physicians into technologically rich areas and worsen the current shortage of specialists in undeserved uh, areas. The DaVinci report has provided users with high resolution three-dimensional imaging. This was largely attributed to the imaging quality robot, which are able to offer image-guided robotic surgery, which has been used frequently in neurosurgery and orthopedic. This involves the use of operative and interoperative images along with track devices to create an interactive map of the deep anatomy, vasculature, and pathology prior to incision. This method of guidance has been of great use, particularly in tumor resection, where surgical margins can be carefully delineated without damaging benign tissue. Recently, fluorescent imaging was attempted in robotic cholecystectomy, and researchers report reported the clear advantages when it came to visualization. Since this is an alternative new technique, only a limited number of fluorescent imaging studies have been conducted, and issues such as dye dosing and injection still have to be addressed. As you can see here, that Raven 2 surgical robot. And you can see that two seven degrees of freedom, surgical manipulators, motion of axis of robots. As you can see here that, the shoulder joint and the elbow joint, it's almost like human, and the tool in sector and retraction, this is the device where it's pulled the instruments up and down. And this is also the tool twist uh, uh, actuation, also the same like the other one. And the Robin 2 is a, a teleoperated robotic system designed to support research and advanced technique for robotic assisted surgery. The first experimental, Platform and surgical robots capable of supporting both software development and experimental testing and medical training. It is commercially available for applied dexterity. It is currently a research platform in 12 universities in the US, Canada, United Kingdom, and France. The motion axis of robot are shoulder joint, elbow, both of them are rotational, and insertion retraction, linear, uh, tool root, which is uh, rotational, tool grasping, rotational, and also 
one wrist activation, which is rotational, and two uh, wrist two activation, which is also rotational. DC motors mounted to the base of actuate all motion axis. The low level control system include real time Linux uh, process. And the key function running inside is uh, a thousand hertz servo loop, which are coordinated transformation, forward inverse uh, kinematics and gravity compensation. The link between the control softwares and the motor control is a USB to interface port. The board can be performed a uh, read write cycle for all uh, eight channels and 125 microseconds. The Raven uh, two system surgical control inputs are collected through the surgical control council. Importive and privacy security of telemedical appliance was first recognized in the mid 1990s. For example, and the author considers security issues related to medical data and multimedia form. More recently, researchers recognize that many modern implantable medical devices, including pacemaker and implantable card, uh, cardioverter defibrillator are vulnerable to a variety of attacks, allowing attackers to wirelessly obtain private patient's information and change devices, as device settings in ways that can directly impact patient health. Very recently, uh, motivated uh, Raven to extreme operation experiment, researchers recognized the importance of cybersecurity of telerobotic surgery. The use of transport layer security, TLS, uh, protocol was uh, uh, proposed to ensure confidentiality, authentication, and authorization of ITP. As you can see here that this is the hospital, this is the surgical robot, and this is the communication channel through the satellite. This, the, sur the surgeon control input and the force and video feedback. And as we said, the hepatic feedback is also an important part that you have to consider. Attacker model, in such operation conditions, we recognize two attack vectors are feasible. Endpoint compromise where either surgeon control console or a robot can be compromised. The endpoint compromise are less interesting since physical access to either side will likely to be strictly monitored. Network and communication-based attacks thus represent a more feasible way to compromise the system. Moreover, due to their abundance and variability mitigation, these attacks are likely to be intellectually challenging. The most likely uh, point of attack appears to be between the network uplink and surgical robot. And the rest of the paper that will focus on the disruption manipulation attacks against surgeon robots communication links. So what are the implications of presented attacks? A compromised surgical robot in the mid set uh, uh, and midst of even routine operations could potentially be used to inflict considerable internal, internal wounds to a patient. Moreover, any extra procedure time caused by compromised system may be severe consequences on a procedure outcome. The action, surgeon action, hepatic feedback, and robotic video feed may all contain a private and protected patient related information. Okay. For surgeons, the possibility of surgery systems being compromised complicate the issue of legal responsibility for their actions during the procedure. And compromised system, for example, hepatic feedback may be modified to cause surgeon to harm patients. If one can claim that was responsible to expect that the surgeon should have uh, noticed that hepatic feedback was modified, then the result malpractice lawsuit might be uh, strengthened. Teleoperation security threat may have further implication for surgical robots. Finally, any security holes in the teleoperated system present an existently threat to the field of surgical robots as a whole. From a patient perspective, all the advantages in recovery or success rates that come from uh, teleoperated surgery may not be worth the risk of having potentially hijacked machine operates on them. So in conclusion, the purpose of this discussion was awareness of security uh, issue and cyber physical system. And Raven 2, we were able to uh, breach several concerning elements of the system over wide attack surface and some extremely efficient with a single packet.
Yet some of these attacks could have easily been uh, prevented by using well-established and uh, readily uh, available security mechanism, including uh, encryption and authentication. Our experimental results uh, show that incorporating that mechanism into telerobotic surgery system with an average quality computer increase memory usage by only about 300 kilobytes while maintaining the system real-time responsiveness. This increase is likely to be acceptable in tele-robotic surgery with caution. And for example, encryption and authentication, video feedback will likely cause an acceptable decrease in packet uh, throughout uh, rate. Uh, and finally, we believe that a presented concern are not unique in teleoperated surgery, but are common uh, in all teleoperated robots. Because of the wide variety of physical digital capabilities, these systems uh, with uh, tele-robotic surgery needs to become for a front and center. I think that was the last slide. Any question, Ikhwan, I believe that was our last presentation for today. Thank you very, mu very much, Dr. Harbi, for this uh, nice uh, information. Thanks. Any question from the audience? 